Wow, that was anticlimactic. And it was pretty incredible. Uh, can everyone hear us? And is the <sighs> audio working correctly? Mark decided to massively overcomplicate this. Um, and Happy New Year's to everyone. Hopefully you had a good time with your families. Yes, Happy New Year's to everyone. I am greatly uh, excited to be here today uh, in the new studio space that we constructed. This took, what, 15 years in the making? Uh, yeah, this guy messaged me for like a week. He's like, oh my God, I got all my foam foam. Don't touch walls. it, dude. I don't want to fall off. <laughs> I don't know how the glue's holding up. It hasn't set yet. It's been I built my years. Ikea desk. Yep, my Ikea desk was the only one in stock because there's a shortage of every single thing, apparently. Oh, I went to go buy some cubes for organizing my hard drives and stuff. Didn't It said it was in stock. I go downstairs. I'm like, oh, where is it at? Every high bay rack is empty. It's like, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm like, I just wasted an hour in this dump. Did you get meatballs at least? I did get meatballs, but they were subpar. I, the people in the cafeteria were like, what is this guy doing here? Why is he bothering us? Especially when I asked for extra lingonberry sauce, they're like, <laughs> 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 screw this guy. Um, okay, all right. So I know there are some topics that Mark wants to talk about before we answer everyone's questions. There's some Patreon questions we need to go through. Yes. And there are some lovely paid and unpaid questions we are going to attempt to ask. Every donated question, we promise we will ask, answer like we always do in every regular question, at least the major ones we'll try to get to as well. Uh, so what's the first topic you want to talk about before I get to about a billion Patreon questions? Yeah, there's going to be a lot of questions, it, so let's just get this out of the way. There's going to be, this is going to be a long, long session. Three hours is what I'm going to tap out at. Okay, so. Jack's going to tap out at three hours. I've committed to 15. This is going to be like <laughs> the Lamar race, 24 hours where I just crash. <laughs> I'm going to hit my head on the you're, desk. Uh, so you, you want to be a uh, be fast bender is what you're saying? Uh, no, like, I'm not going to get into fast bender. That's actually a good topic, but uh, we're not tonight. So the, the format is podcast Q&A, so podcast style and question and answer, obviously, as this banner suggests here for those uh, that are... Oh, like, Rick, thank you for, for the uh, beef and cheddar money. I'm sure that will go very poorly for my health long term, or at least Mark's. Um, and Adam, thank you for your $50 donation. That's very kind. Wow. Yeah, we're already starting with the money. And that's, uh, you know, let's get a lot more coming in here. <laughs> I got I to gotta finish the remodel in here. <laughs> um, I will answer this question right away. Forget full foot. Uh, we are doing a 987.2 Cayman video. It's next month. I'm trading my, uh, my GR86 with uh, Greg from Chicago Auto Pros. And he's giving me a stock car for a week or two to shoot a video. This was... Uh, Another question uh, about the Kirkland hoodie signature, and uh, he's considering a WRX for his next car. Have you guys had any experience with the 2022, 2023 model? Yeah, we have a pretty long video on an orange one we did. We dynoed it whole nine yards, and it was in the uh, comparison test we did with the Civic SI and a couple other vehicles. It's it's a it's the best regular WRX in recent memory. It's just kind of not great looking, so. You know? There's nothing wrong with the car. It's just not hyper exciting. It does what it's set out to do as being a daily driver that's all-wheel drive and somewhat fun to drive and a lot of capability. The The body's way better than it used to be, more rigid and all that, but it's just... It's, it's still a Subaru. And it I, also it was, has the RTV problems my GR86 has. I, I mean, I, I still think it's pretty good, honestly. I, I enjoy driving it. I don't know that it's my type of car to own, but uh, I'm going to leave it at that. All right, so let's get through the, the, the topic questions before we start answering all these questions. And Yes, yeah, so, so let's, let's hit the topic. So if anybody's thinking about, you know, d donating or whatever you want to call or it, Super Chat. sort of regular questions. Let, let's Chat. hold off that just for the sake of, like, hey, um, don't, just so we can get through some of the initial topics. Because I, I really want to break this up in, so it's not just all us answering questions. And the, the first topic that I want to get into is the FL Type R video. That's all you, Mark. Uh, Jack was not involved in that at all, and thank God for him. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a shit show, honestly. And so I'm going to explain it just briefly. I bought a Type R, and I bought a Type R. Much like uh, your X7, because I told you to. Yeah, Jack's like, oh, man, you should get it. You should get an X7. It would be such a great deal. Deplete your 401k. Yeah. <laughs> I bought all these cars and I've never used any resources from manufacturers or any of that before. I've, uh, like that, the X7 was like the worst buying experience ever. Like the worst dealer experience ever. And I still stuck it out and bought it. But that, the FL5 is the first car where 
uh, we contacted the Honda reps, or you made a connection for me with the Honda reps, and they said, okay, maybe we can get you one through the region, which means they allocate you a car, and then they pick the dealer that it goes to, and then they ship that car there specifically for you, and the dealer has to agree to it. So in this case, they asked me what dealer I wanted to go to, and I said, well, anything but Brilliance Honda, because the previous dealership, Crystal Lake Honda, which no longer exists, went bankrupt from screwing people over, doing double loans, the most shady stuff ever. So when the owner, the, the, guy, the owner who was in the video, Kevin, he had an opportunity because he worked for Toyota and then he worked for Honda, like Toyota on the corporate side. He, they gave him an opportunity to buy this franchise because it was in the shitter. And he's like, well, uh, I think he got a good deal on it. I'm not sure about the financial part, but then he had to turn all of this around. But because it burned me as a kid, I never wanted to deal with anything to do with that. So when our Honda rep said, well, you know, this is who we use, this is our agreement. And the dealership actually has a lot of, uh, they work with the Chicago Auto Show. The, the owner works with that side of it and they, they have some connections in the media. But for my part, really all it was was, Honda's like, okay, the car's coming, which I never believed. And then I got a call, well, it's on its way. And then it got delayed in shipping. It got stuck at the port, all this. And finally it showed up. And I went and talked to the owner and the owner's family. And I'm like, this is what happened to me in the past. Like, what do you think? And he explained everything to me. Like the fact that they're not the old dealership, that they spent years trying to fix it, that they understand how the industry has a bad name. And they they only sell to local people, like Illinois only. They yeah, don't like sell. Yeah, St. Charles. I, for the GR86 series, which is more for a viewer series than it is for a personal purchase in any way, uh, the Toyota region sent me up with St. Charles, and they only sell to locals as well. Right. Which makes sense, because if you look at, and we talked about this too, and there's so much in this video we didn't talk about. We talked about Carvana, mm -hmm. specifically why they're failing. And Carvana's failing because they did not understand how difficult it was to sell cars to every single state. So if you have a company and you're like, okay, we have a buyer out of state, every state has different requirements for titling, different paperwork requirements, different uh, loan requirements from the banks for each region. So it became a mess and they couldn't meet all the state requirements. So they made mistakes on paperwork. They didn't get things to the DMV. So they have all these customers that don't have titles, they didn't have their, their loans set up properly, all this drama, so they're like six months behind on everything, they don't have the resources to do it, so that's why they don't wanna do it. They're all small company, local business, that can only sell locally. And I didn't say that in the video and it came across as like a plug for them, like, hey, come to them and they, they're gonna help you out. No, they're not, because they can't. And the, the other part was I did a really bad job of telling the story. The reason I wanted to tell the story about the LFL5 is the first Civic I ever bought was a red EX. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this was a big purchase for me. And I had all of these like nostalgic feelings because I did everything much like you. I traveled across the US. It was the first car I could afford that was good that I did everything with. So this red type bar was like, I said in the CRX video, I wanted to close the loop I wanted to close out all these stories about these Honda cars that I loved as a kid. That's why I'm doing the NSX video. That's, you know, we're trying to go to Japan that to do. That is a disaster to put yeah. together. That's something we'll talk about later, but God, is that a fucking nightmare? Yeah, yeah so all these Honda videos I want to do, they're because I want to do it. And when I talked to the dealership and learned about all the bullshit that they had to deal with from a small business and just how much hatred is there for oh, the dealership the, experience? The reason I'm looking at my phone is so I can answer the questions, by the way. Okay, people, yeah. I'm not bored of this conversation. That's the reason why I'm, I'm looking at the Yeah, phone. we don't have a moderator yeah. today, just so you know. Uh, um, chin face is out getting hair plugs. So yeah, he's finally getting his plugs, thank God. Uh, so, yes, I put him in the video, and it was a lot longer. The video was like 45 minutes because I had a lot of interview footage. And I just got tired of it, and I didn't felt, feel like it flowed well. And then I forgot to tell my own story. I didn't tell my own story well that this was about repairing my past relationship with a brand that I had a lot of bad experiences with. And the end of the video is me at the old dealership that got that closed, and I was turning off the lights. And it was supposed to be symbolic of me like closing the chapter on old Mark and here's the new mark with the new car. But of course, everybody took it as a giant flex. Like, uh, how can you get a car for MSRP, a Civic like this, where nobody else can get it? And and I told the owner of the dealership because he was really concerned. They got a lot of hate. <laughs> like, they got a lot of hate because they thought I was making an ad for them. And no, I was just telling my own story. And I sent him an email about the four things that I thought honestly had happened in that video that I didn't account for. And that's my mistake because I didn't realize that people were so angry about like what's going on in the car industry. Um, 
And it's the lack of inventory and dealer gouging that's going on, right? Especially in the th enthusiast car market, that people have to jump through so many hoops. In the case of the GR Corolla and the Civic, these are gold standard affordable cars Basically for people. Basically every enthusiast car. Yes, and it's just not the cheap ones, it's the expensive ones. The Z06, the GT3s, like all of these are hyper expensive and then the, the dealers know that they can't get them. So any car they get, they're sitting on it and people are angry. So if you can't get one locally, you start going out of state, you find out a dealer is not gonna sell it to you because you're out of state and you, they don't really do a good job explaining why, which I just tried to do. And then they want to charge 20000 over sticker for a car that should be like forty five grand. People are pissed off about it. So they're naturally angry at me for getting a car for MSRP because I'm like entitled media. Like, why should I get it? Um, the other part, which I wanted to talk about the media side, is the vaporware aspect of these cars. They're paying, these companies are paying a lot of money. In the case of Toyota and Honda, these are the recent ones. They're paying a lot of money to send media on these trips. And they get everybody excited for these cars, like GR Corolla, GR E6, Type R, all of that. And they're like, look at how cool these cars are. We're making it cheap. It's an entry level price. At well, the GR E6 is the same way. You can't get them. Right. So then you see all this on the internet. People get excited. And then they go to buy it. And there's only like 300 in the country. They can't get them made. And then people are like, are they, are they artificially not making these cars? Are they artificially not making them so the dealers can make more money? And I think the reality is, is when you look at GR Corolla and the FRS or 86 and the Type R, they're in factories where normal cars are made. And right now, because there's such a shortage on commodity cars, they are not going to prioritize the enthusiast cars over the commodity cars where dealerships need those to make money. And if you're, a, if you're one of these brands, let's be honest, the demand on paper looks like it's huge for a Type R. If you looked at the internet, you'd think they'd sell a million of these cars. But the reality is they would probably maybe sell 15,000 the first year in the US. Mm -hmm. So they're not gonna move around production for the specialty car to reduce production of a car they could potentially sell for like 250,000 for. All that matters to OEMs is if they make money. And the reality is, even with the specialty car factories, uh, by the end of this month, you'll see our C8 manufacturing yeah. video. And I can tell you for a fact, spending a lot of time with the engineers at that factory and the, the engineers at the company at this point, they're not artificially limiting how many cars they're right. building. They are genuinely trying to build every single car they can with yeah. the available parts they have. Porsche is the same way. When you talk to them, knowing some people who are suppliers for that company, they are building every 911 they possibly can. It's just the way the world works. If you know anyone that owns a factory who builds piece parts for components, they will tell you the same thing. There are part shortages. Yeah, and, and it's, it's definitely affected these cars, and it's, they've prioritized the mainstream cars or the high-volume cars over the enthusiast cars that don't sell a lot. And while it may be a lot of margin for the dealers at this point to scalp, you know, <laughs> 10,000 units of a specialty car at a low price is not going to make it or break it for a dealer or, or for, for an OEM. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing that I, I have to apologize for is because I didn't do a good job of explaining my side of the story of why I got a Type R and then I made it, I came across in a way that made me sound like, oh, I deserve this car. And honestly, I, I, I don't, I don't, it's not a dream car for me. I'm happy to have a Type R, but I would never pay over sticker for it. If, if Honda like dropped it on me last minute, oh, you're gonna have to pay 10,000 over sticker, I wouldn't have a Type R right now. I just don't think it's worth it. Um, and I think there's a lot of people upset with how this works on the back end with people getting cars or special treatment. Um, this happens like all the time. It's not like... I think the difference is journalists, for better or for worse, and I'm, many of you I'm sure don't do this for a living or understand how this works. We have a direct line to the OEMs and the reps want to build relationships with uh, outlets. Car and Driver, Motor Trend, Road and Track have been buying fleet vehicles for right. long-term testers for decades at this point. And the way it works for them is they call up their regional rep, like, hey, I wanna buy one of these. And Lexus, Toyota, whoever's doing it for them will facilitate the transaction. They are paying MSRP. They're not getting special, special treatment financially, but they're making sure the dealer that is working with whoever outlet it may be, like Topher got one of these cars in the case of the Type R, Rady, and like five other different outlets. Yeah got these vehicles, all Honda did was hook them up with the dealer and assure the dealer that they got an allocation. The allocation that was going to said dealer 
wasn't being pulled from another customer. Right. And, and they did. So the dealers that got media cars for people like myself, they also got another allocation. In the case of this dealership, their allocation winds up having to go to the Chicago Auto Show because they don't have another car to show at the Chicago Auto Show for a Type R. So he actually has to use his inventory to display it as a display piece. So again, it goes back to the fact that they're not making enough of these cars to meet demand and shit rolls downhill and everybody's pissed off because everything's too expensive. You can't get fun cars for cheap. And then you got me like a dumbass, like, oh, look, I got a Type R and nobody else can get it. That's not what this is about for me. I love, I've been in Honda since I was a kid. I own forums. I was a partial own, owner in like Honda Focus forums for enthusiast groups for like five years before I sold it. I've had, between the two of us, we have like 20 Hondas. It's not just like hopping on the bandwagon of the cool car, but that's what it sounds like. And that's what it looks like doing this. So, you know, anybody that's pissed off, I apologize for that. I just, I, I didn't tell the story right. So anyway, uh, it's enough about that. There, there's other stuff too with the media part of it um, that I mentioned about the business side of this. Um, and I think you know, on the back end, people don't understand it. And y I think you tell it really well about the media relationship with OEMs and how that works because people think we get paid to review cars. There's a lot of misconception no. uh, that uh, journalists or media, like here's a car, we're gonna pay you for it and that's how we make money and that's not how this works. The way the transaction works, to put it pretty bluntly, is OEMs get access to, sorry, forgive me, outlets, journalists, YouTubers, vloggers, whatever. When I think journalists, I think traditional buff books, car and driver, road and track, motor trend, uh, automobile magazine, if that thing still exists, would get vehicles from OEMs to do a story on. The logistics from the vehicle, it getting to you, if you go on a press trip, all of that is covered by the OEM. You're responsible for gas and a lot of other fun stuff you are not getting paid by the OEM to review the car. You are making money off the content you produce. There's not a direct exchange of goods. Certain magazines like Motor Trend, Car and Driver, Road and Track will do paid advertisements mm -hmm. or paid features that are specifically labeled as ads for specific OEMs. But the general stories you're seeing aren't paid. Even our giant documentary films you're seeing that we do, like on Z06, Z, it's the same thing. They cover a lot, some of the, a lot of the, a lot or many of the logistics costs. Well, they wouldn't, but I have to like, literally when we do some of these projects now, I have to put my foot down. Like, I want to do this. I want to do these big videos, but I'm not going to pay $4,000 for travel because we're not making that money back to do this. And the Honda stuff, at least on the NSX, which we'll get to later, this is because I want to do it. Honda's not like, oh, here's some money. We'd love to see an NS NSX piece that we don't care about anymore because we don't make it. This is stuff that I want to do and it's stuff that comes out of my pocket. And the, the reality is there's not unlimited money to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. There's not a huge return. You have to crank out things. And in my case, I want to do it a certain way and that costs money. It mm -hmm. really does cost money to do this. So but they're not paying. The, correct. Traditionally, at least, unless it's a paid ad. And it has, we have to say that, yeah. you know, like even on YouTube, you can't just put something that's paid and not say that it's sponsored. You have to have a flag on that. Otherwise, it's a, a terms of use violation. And if you're big media like Motor Trend and all them, you'll see it. It's like sponsored by yep. or like funded by or it has a title sponsorship to pay for it. And th that's how they do it to make supplemental money. But we've never done that with a manufacturer before unless I'm mistaken on anything, any car manufacturer. Well, how do you think I have my STOs and my yeah, your, your Lamborghinis? Yeah, yeah, all my Equinox. Yeah. Paid reviews are great. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I, I will say as well, the, the relationship between OEMs and brands is, is interesting, right? It is still a human relationship. So if you piss them off, you shit on every single one of their vehicles and you, through personal bias and you can't point out objective faults with the vehicle, you know, it's within their best interest and, in, well, not necessarily yours as the outlet, right. but it's within their best interest and not to want to do business with you. Right. Ferrari's famous for if they get a bad review, you're done with them. Yes. And that's that's the pro and the con of this. That's why we, when we are negative, we try to back it up with objective facts. I, and I 100%, I would 100% agree with that. It's a slippery slope with uh, all this stuff where, um, you you realize that you can't just do whatever you want with this. You just can't. Um, and this is a good example, like this NSX video uh, that I did a long time ago, which is six years ago. I drove with their, their factory driver at that point, and then I had a, a philosophical conversation with him about 
the new NSX at that time. And I brought up the fact, like, you drive GT3s. He's a Porsche driver. He drives GT3s. I'm like, how does this compare? And it put him in a spot where not only did it get him in trouble because he said it without saying it that he preferred the GT3s over the NSX. And then I went on a tirade how they engineered out, out the driver of the car. And I, we, I did not get Honda press cars after this video Honda or Acura press cars after this video for probably four years. I basically had to restart the relationship with them in the formal capacity. Yes, and and that's the reality. Like it, it hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been flowers and roses. And there's things that you can get away with, and there's things that you can't. And generally, I'm brutally honest. Like I know, I, Jack always says it, dude. You know, we're running a business here. You can't just be a total dick about stuff. So you bury it in sarcasm. You try to find a grounded root of like what's really wrong objectively. It, it has to be objective. It's not just like, I don't like the paint color. This thing's, this thing's ugly. You know, you can't get, you know, you can say that, but I, I don't even, that's why I don't talk about the exterior cars anymore. Like me going off about how it's ugly does the OEM no justice at all. They already know the car's ugly because that's all they hear about. So I, we try to focus on like, how's it drive? Is there a transmission issue? Why do they do this? It makes way more sense, but we're probably more negative than most people. I mean, our, our even our Z06 documentary, if you watch that, the final thoughts, probably some of the most negative there are of any video on that car and it's negativity based in objective fact yeah. and based upon engineering decisions they make but if you paint it that way for oems it's typically more accepted because you can have an open dialogue with an engineer right all engineering is i'm an engineer i can tell you this so when you work on a project is what compromises you can live with that's all it comes down to and that's how cars work too and people seem to forget that well i think that's how business works right it, it's about the engineering of like things but it's also like trying to do what we're doing is you have to find that balance of like what compromises are you willing to make to do this you're not going to get cars shipped to you from manufacturers if you just regurgitate all over all, all of them it just doesn't work that way so it has to be this honest relationship that gets built up and not only that it's about the viewership right our responsibility is to the viewers, the people that are actually watching these videos. That's why I started this, because I wanted to hear about the things that nobody was talking about. I wanted to learn about these things that nobody was talking about. Either they didn't have the knowledge to share the information, they didn't want to spend the time, because as we've done this, we realize why nobody does it. And you had a conversation with a guy from, was it Car and Driver or Motor Trend? One of the, I think it was Motor Trend, and he flat out told me that uh, consumers are essentially too stupid to consume technical information and people don't care. Obviously our business is based on that not being true, but a lot of the uh, former, or let's call it current journalists in the industry don't understand anything remotely technical. And the reps, other than certain brands, don't want to know anything technical because right. a lot of them are formerly journalists or don't come from a technical background and they don't value it. And that's why you see marketing from certain brands the way it is. That's why you see content being the the way it is. They like making sure that information that is available to consumers is basically for the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Which with how expensive cars are now, particularly in a uh, performance capacity, it's sort of depressing because you unfortunately or fortunately need a professional job now to afford any of the stuff that's new, which is... It, it's it, And it goes back to like the whole thing with the anger level that people are having towards these types of products, especially on the enthusiast side. Obviously, the enthusiasts are the loudest voice all the time of like what they like and they don't like. But I can't believe how many people... And this, this goes back to the comment I made in that Civic video. Like, we know that we're making videos and that people listen to them. I'm not telling people to go buy cars. I'm just saying, like, we like these cars. We think they're a good buy. And it, I talk to people, the viewership, just like we talk to our family. I can, I mean, like, I looked at my dad's, like, health care helper. She just bought a RAV4. I'm on the phone with, a, like, a, a really close relative. They bought two RAV4s. Now they want to buy another one, but they, they're looking for something else. So now they're going to buy a Venza. Um, a, another family member has a... Uh, RAV4, your girlfriend has a RAV4, mm -hmm. you know, like all these people in this short window, that's just the people we know. And there is a lot of sphere of influence and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with trying to be honest to people about what is good and what's not from not just a bullshit level of like, oh, look at all the features because everything is feature driven, right? Mm -hmm. Like if it, otherwise every single CUV and SUV would be identical, which they pretty much are. So they have to pack on all of this stuff 
to make it like, oh, look at all the things that we have, all the bells and whistles. That's the only way salespeople can push these things to make them any difference other than price. And at, at the end of it, like everything's so complicated now, it's really hard to weed through that. And that's what our job is. And it's becoming far more complicated to do than it ever has in the past because of, of everything that we're seeing. Um, sorry. No, no worries. All right, let's, let's touch the, yeah. ne the next topic as we sort of beat that one to death. Sorry if that's put anyone to sleep. Yeah, I know. I just wanted to get that out of the way. Clearly, you know, we could sit here and answer questions all day, but there's some interesting topics um, that I've wanted to hey, cover hey, for hey, a while. Been flagging me. I haven't. I haven't done anything, so I got to go back and flag them while you start answering certain questions. Um, the Dell integration, really quick. All right. You're going to see a couple more of these Dell integrations in in. Well, I mean, it's integrated in every video. Like it's clear that I'm doing that. Uh, we're going to be putting it into the Z Z06 factory video that we're doing that should be out in two weeks. Um, I'm trying to convert over a lot of my technology and pushing forward. So you'll see me talking about HDR and I know that matters to about a handful of people, but I wanna make sure that the content is at the highest quality possible. And now that I have equipment and I have all these resources to do it, I'm gonna keep leveraging that and the support. So you're gonna see that and I just wanna be transparent about it. You're gonna see a lot more of it. Um, this next one is a big topic. Jack likes to talk about Corvettes. Well, um, you're going to be hearing a lot more about Corvettes this year. We are doing, assuming it gets off the ground, uh, our first big like factory backed by both OEMs comparison test between a certain company that makes four liters in German cars and a uh, Z06 around a racetrack with a pro driver, same, same tires, Cup 2Rs, a pretty good idea. I assume you know what I'm talking about. That'll be shot in early spring. We have our factory video coming out, which is has very little to do with a specific car, but how cars are made. And one of the things we don't get to talk about often, because most people don't find it interesting, is the manufacturing process. People seem to forget that cars are made by people, yeah. for people. They aren't made by some Amazon robot in some factory somewhere and then airdropped to a dealership. These take supply chains, yeah. training, just the engineering associated with manufacturing. Like I come from an ME background, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I spend a lot of time in factories. And just getting the workflow through is incredible. And you think about how complicated a car is, how that has to be built by human beings. Hopefully you get to appreciate more of that in this video. It's gonna be very similar to our Z06 film in that you're gonna hear directly from engineers, people that media typically doesn't get access to. And we're gonna to try to explain how a car is made. And the beautiful part is it's not only just that, like how all of them are made, Jack got to see his own car go down the line. And while we're trying to correct the mistake I made with the FL5 type bar, like being like, hey, I got this car, this is this is how I would have wanted to do it. And that's what we did with Jack's car. It's an un unbelievably rare opportunity that you never get to see of having access to the people that designed everything, seeing them make it, and then seeing your own car go down the line. But really for the more... For me, it was, I think I was more excited than you to see this, honestly. I didn't get to see Jack's car go down the line, but when we went to shoot again, to see the level of, like, I, I got so excited about the paint booth, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how the hell, I this is what I asked the engineers, and he's probably like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? I asked them how they got the paint off the spray booth grates. Like, mm -hmm. all the parts that go through, all the hang-on panels, like, all that overspray gets on grates. Like, how do you clean that? The carts come in clean and they go out with paint on them. How do they get the paint off the carts that go through? Like, all the logistical nightmare of all this from ventilation, it's just amazing. And I hope we capture just, if we capture 10% of all that in this video, I'll feel pretty good about it. I, I, bottom line is, I think people really like it. I hope so, at least. Yeah. Um, it, it's a very, very cool story. And the people involved, much like our original Z06 video, are amazing. They're very passionate. They're, they're, they're happy to be there. And I was telling Mark, because this, this was a project that took many, many different trips to film all yeah. this. Uh, the first time I was there, Mark's like, oh, how was it? And he and I make fun of Corvettes all the yeah, time. Yeah, of course. Because it's, it's easy, right? The stereotypes are often true. And I'm like, these people are really happy to be here. And he's like, no, no, no. They put on a face. And when you're actually there with them, they are happy to be there. And it's, the sad truth is, or, or the, the, the pro, depending on who you are, that's sort of the apex of American cars made here in the U.S. is the Z06 and the all the future performance variants. It's about as good as American manufacturing gets here. Now that the NSX Type S is dead, 
right? That Ohio plant isn't building the NSX anymore. Right. I can't really name another American supercar that's built here. Yeah, I mean, you could get into the the boutique manufacturing, yeah, like, product yeah, like that type of stuff. But yeah, to that to that level, yeah, we we just don't see it. So it is special, especially if you're in the United States. I, I there's this mixed thing of like manufacturing going away and all these jobs going away and we've seen it decimated and there's like a lot of good reason why it has and there's all these internal politics of why Someone said Ford GT. The Ford GT was built in Canada. It's and it was a Multimatic car. car. Yeah. yeah. So, or was it Multimatic? Yeah, it was a Multimatic okay. car. It wasn't actually assembled by Ford per se. Yeah. So that, that's even, that's like a race division, you know, that put that thing together. Just like a, like the GT 350 R like race cars, the Multimatic cars, those were not even through this, like a traditional assembly line. But I mean, any, anyway, really it's just special because we don't see that level of manufacturing. Everything's gone. You know, the jobs are gone. So you see these people at the pinnacle, like this is the best that it could possibly be for those those workers and the people there they have a lot of budget they have a lot of respect and it just shines through which you know well, hopefully our video yeah, captures I, I hope so anyway that's a, it's a long diatribe uh, and a sex video so we've been talking about this for about a billion years at this point we've already shot let's call it the meat and potatoes of the video the thing we've been trying to do and it's the it's been my job in some ways i've failed at this but it's also the joys of dealing with uh japanese and american honda at the same time in trying to get this to work correctly is many of the teams or team members of the original NSX, the Gen 1, have pseudo agreed to come out of retirement to talk about this car. Yohara, some of the technical people who have worked on the original car have all agreed to be on video. And initially when Honda, we approached Honda about this because this is a, it's not, it hasn't been done by an American team yet to do a documentary on this car while these people are still alive and a lot of their fun stuff. And as soon as we talk about the logistics involved with it, Honda North America, uh, quite frankly, doesn't give two shits about the Gen 1 NSX. And the Gen 2, the hybrid car, is sort of uh, the unloved child of the family. It's not particularly valued by Japan and wasn't the most successful car here in North America. So their enthusiasm to support this project has been interesting. Yeah, and I, Basically, yeah. a lot of promises on their end fell through. So we're trying to now get this to uh, come full circle with support from certain members at Honda and King Motorsports specifically. Yeah, so that I, I'm gonna leave it at that. This is the longest project that I've ever tried to get, get done um, because I wanted to, like again, it's about closing the loop of all mm -hmm. my favorite Honda cars and I wanted, I really wanted to get these guys on camera before they're gone and it's, it's just more, it's more difficult than I thought. And it's a lot of money, like international travel, like somebody's got to pay for that. Like, I'm not just going to go and do like, Hey, I want to, I want to interview all these guys and, you know, bring them out of retirement for the sake of a video that advertises a brand without having some of those logistics. I'm not asking you to get paid, but something's got to be covered from it. And we haven't been able to, to get to that place. And I'm like, we have probably we have so much stuff shot for this thing already that it's like you, when they talk about projects that sit in the can for too long this is one of them. it's a bad sign honestly i think what we have is great but we don't have the final story and i don't just want to talk about the american side of the nsx because it's I, nothing other it, than yeah. the current car it's right. nothing and even then the current car is not all that exciting and i think it's a car that came out too early for its own good mm -hmm. And while the Type S, I mean, tech, from a technology perspective, the fact that they made a hybrid supercar that was all aluminum, you know, all these things that you want, and it was at the price point it was, was very, very impressive. But I think it's sort of been made irrelevant by everything else that's come out. Yeah. The fact that it wasn't a focused car. Yeah, I, yeah. And I mean, we're going to talk more about that. I think when we get the NSX video out, I, I will talk more about the differences between the old and new and some of the old and new Honda mentalities and the split internally. I think there's a huge split between the Japanese engineers, the American side, what we want versus what they want, leadership. It's just this weird, like, weird disconnect between what everybody wants to do and then the long-term vision of the brand, which is not internal combustion, it's hybrid, and it's electric only. So these types of cars that we're talking about are like, we're over it, you know, like... Some of the American team at Honda here is great. Our rep is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of the leadership we've met have been very, very nice to be around. Right. Like, Jonathan Rubber is the guy we interviewed for Integra the first time around. Great guy. Just a weird, disconnected brand, I think. And some of these cars, some of these... The, there's a disconnect, I feel like, between marketing, leadership, and some of the engineers. Yeah. 
and it, it it's troubling. Like if you compare this to GTR, someone brought it up in the comments, and again, that's why I'm looking at my phone. Um, Nissan has no budget. They have no money, but their team members care about cars that have been dead for 40 years or 30 years. Like if you talk to really any of them, Dan Pass specifically, Jonathan, about legacy Nissan products, they perk up and they are more excited to talk about those things than I've, I could ever be myself. And that shows up. Like Tamura-san, the gentleman we had in both Z and GTR, it really is his life's work. Yeah. And he's made it his mission in life to talk about those cars and celebrate the people who worked on them. Obviously including himself, but right. celebrate those products. It's, it's a bit disheartening that Acura, Honda doesn't have that same... I think I, I don't I think they're passionate about it, but being passionate about it in the U.S., where a lot of these cars are not designed, is different than the actual like parent company that's doing all the engineering and development. I mean, there's only certain level they can go to be like, this is what we want, and even though you may be the primary market for a lot of these sales, they still you know, like they're not making the car. The Japanese are making the car, so you it's it's really hard to thread that needle and get these people to, to really work together. But every brand is like that. You'll hear it from the German brands, the US side, to the Germans don't really work cohesively. The Koreans are very, very separated. You know, most of the Korean brands that we see in the United States, they're there purely for product planning and like marketing and all that. They're not like we're not coming up with anything in the US for any of like the Hyundai and Kia stuff other than you know market trends potentially. But uh, that's a lot of inside baseball, Jack. Is there any other topics you want to answer before we answer some of the paid questions and Patreon questions? Uh, I will tell you what we have in the can, and we'll, we'll cover that in a little bit. Uh, we'll cover whatever is left. Um, there's some other BS topics that I want to hit, but let's get right into um, the general top, the general questions and the uh, super Can you go chances. back and flag all the questions I will. While paid? you're doing the Patreon stuff, we're starting off with that. All right, so as we promised our loyal Patreon members, we are going to attempt to answer as many questions as possible. And this time around, I will actually go back and whatever I don't answer, Mark or I will comment and try to answer. Um, the first question is, oh uh, man, we got a lot. Bear with me as I scroll to the beginning of this. Man, there are a lot of questions. Uh, do, 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 do. Are there executive and bull are the executive and bullion tiers real? How did I miss this announcement? Yes, we do have a bullion and executive tier for our Patreon, and they are real. I don't necessarily suggest you join those tiers, but if you feel like pissing away your money, feel free. <laughs> yeah, it's they're a joke for just but, people who want to donate because we constantly on Patreon get people that are just like, I just want to give more. Do you have another tier? So we created, I think it was Bullion Boys, where all we talk about is gold bars, and you know, I. I, it's a joke. It's yes. sarcasm. It's not like we're talking about... Patreon uh, essentially allows us to run some of these big docu-films at a loss because often, like things like the old Z video were a good example. They didn't make money. Right. No, and we spent, what, a week there to do the Z video? Yeah, and what, three weeks editing? But the Z video is a perfect example of why we do this. You have a team that's passionate about mm -hmm. it and they didn't have a lot of money to work with to re-engineer that car and work with it, but they put everything they had in terms of passion to make that car and get it done. So in a way, like for me, I don't have a problem doing that so much, but that was a case that was a breaking point for me because I spent a lot of money for that trip and we didn't make it back. So that's where the turning point for me personally as a businessman or whatever you want to call it, I'm like, Jack, we can't lose money doing this stuff. You just can't. So we've had to be a lot more smart. I had to sell my Chiron. Yeah, yeah. Jack, Jack sold all the supercars. How many factories did you have to take offline? Well, thankfully, uh... BMW and Audi and VW still use Piano Black, so I'm doing all right. Okay, good. Um, what happened to the S2000 Mods video? Uh, sooner or later that'll come out. As many of you may or may not have been watching the GR86 series, uh, the original plan was to compare that to the S2000 because of all our projects this year. I just got a lap time done, and we sort of talked about it in between. I think the S2000, outside of maybe another set of wheels, is going to sit the way it has been for a long time. You sort of ruined that car or didn't ruin it by uh, widening out the fenders for the bigger tires. But past that, it's pretty much the way it's been for a long time, right? It has, yeah. It's It's been that way for a long time. Uh, Christoph asks, thoughts on Ford canceling the Fiesta and Focus in Europe? Two of the most iconic models will not be replaced once this model year ends. I think when you talk to the Ford folks, and I've got to spend, he and I got to spend a lot of time with the head of Ford Performance they are focusing on being a global brand 
And for them, financially, for better or for worse, it means all of their products they sell have to be able to be sold in a uh, global capacity. So what that means is if you can't sell uh, the Focus and Fiesta here in your biggest markets, it's not going to be worth it to them, so they're going to be focusing on SUVs. Is it sad? Yes. Is it the way Ford works? Also yes. Speaking to that guy, you know, each brand has its own identity and philosophy about their products. What he seemed most proud about versus individual products like GT350R, GT500, Raptor, R, regular Raptor, is that they have a performance variant of nearly every vehicle they sell, and that's what he was excited about, the fact that they have such a broad number of products and that all the markets are sold in, which is a very different perspective than I'm used to, and that sort of, yeah. they're business people, right. Ford are business people. He's proud that Ford Performance can build cool cars and that they make a shitload of money. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh my God, dude. I hope that's a fake account. I had to put it up there. <laughs> I'm like, I, I was like, at, at your, you, what you were talking about was also amusing, but when I saw this, I, my brain broke. Uh, all right, we'll answer some uh, more uh, Patreon questions while this is going. Um, bup, 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 bup. I answered your question, Jay. Uh, when I am streaming Spotify, would I notice or benefit from any of the qualities depicted on your audiographs, including your longer... Uh, reviews. So the way the audio tests work, we have a video that you guys can look up on it. Um, we have a gentleman that helps us who is an audio engineer and is a supplier for automotive OEMs in the audio space. We use a series of software programs that essentially measure the speakers objectively. And I can tell you for a fact, even at Spotify, as long as it's not horribly compressed and you know, through the compression doesn't sound like it's coming out of the bathtub, um, you can hear when an audio system is not good, even with Spotify. I think that's a fair statement, isn't it, Mark? You can. So the, that's an inter- I, I really am into this, and I don't want to get too deep into, into the woods because we could do a whole video about it again. Uh, the way I test it is three ways. You do Bluetooth. Try to do Bluetooth because there's a totally different chipset for testing Bluetooth audio in the car. And almost 99% of cars are not up to date. They're on the like three revisions back or two revisions back on Bluetooth chipsets. So it's really, you're not getting the max quality and there's a ton of compression and the, the whole EQ roll off is like, okay, here, here's the flat graph of it. Because there's so much compression artifact, like, okay, let's roll off the highs and roll off the lows and what you have left with is just the middle part and then they do all this noise reduction shit. So Bluetooth is really bad on a lot of cars and then I listen to find out which one is good and the Volvo was really good. The BMWs are typically really good and it's almost always tied to Bowers. Um, and then uh, Spotify, if you're connected through Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, wired is really your best option. Wireless is, there's some level of compression that changes yep. because your signal strength changes for Wi-Fi. So there's some buffering effect, but typically wired is the best. Um, but in or, short, you can, you can tell a difference. You can tell a difference. I'm sorry, and, yeah. And the audio tests we do, one of them is frequency response, and the mm -hmm. other one's just showing general curve. General curve shows whether you have too much high, too much low, what frequency is being rolled off and what's not. Yeah. It's complicated, but it is accurate, and that's why we do it. And the reason why it's not on the screen for 40 seconds is it's YouTube. You can press the pause You can button. pause it. Yeah, and it's hard. We, need to, we did do an audio testing video explaining a lot of this, but what we really need to do is sit down and explain the graphs. The two major ones you're going to look at is frequency response and SPL, which is sound pressure level. You just look at those graphs. It should be very, very like flat as much as possible. There's always going to be a roll off in the highs and a little bit in the low because the speakers can't produce the entire frequency range in a car. It's impossible. So when you see a graph that's like the bass is up here and there's huge drops all over the place, that's typically where you hear it audibly because your ears are really sensitive to changes in like sharp changes in tone, like or are sharp changes in volume change, and that's sometimes they roll off volume too, which is the worst. But when you see a graph that's more flat, that's typically a system that's had more money or time spent in engineering. That's, that's where I'll leave it with that. Um, and what's the worst audio system we've heard to just quickly answer one of the Super Chat questions? Oh, man, The we... Ridgeline was probably the worst car we've ever tested. It sounds like literally phone speakers in the car. It, everything about it is bad. It's, it's got the worst. If you ever want to get in there, um, 
so the the test that I did was a, a song that started with acoustic and I got electronic like bass in it. So the the acoustic is like, oh yeah, everything's level, and then the bass kicks in and all the acoustic guitar disappears out of the song because it's like trying to protect the sound system because <laughs> it can't reproduce the bass. I mean, it's like almost comical how bad it was. Um, they spent probably twenty dollars on it, like on the back end, if that if twenty that. bucks. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure the piece parts alone were like ten dollars. Uh, will you review? Uh, the LC500 coupe with the new handling characteristics. It's at LC500, so we will try to get one in the press fleet. Yeah, for sure. Um, any news on the upcoming rear-wheel drive six-cylinder platform from Mazda? Uh, we will be doing a video in the following months on that. Don't be too worried about that. Uh, any thoughts on the B9.5A4? I'm looking to replace my G20 uh, 330i. Audi and us have an interesting relationship. Um, they aren't particularly good about getting us press cars. They were very kind and finally got us an RS3, but they are they just don't care about the Midwest. Basically, we have to be in one of the coasts to get cars from them in any real capacity. So that's where we're at. If I can ever get an A4, I'll tell you, but the 3 Series is a pretty good platform. We have an ES right now. I picked it up because we gave the ES as a um, one of the luxury or mid-sized car contenders. And being in it, while it is very quiet and it is very comfortable, compared to, you know, modern Claw or one of the rear-wheel drive platforms, it's definitely lacking in any form of dynamics. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, will we be able to get a M340i? If any of you guys wanted to take a whiskey shot at my mention of the B58, <laughs> uh, I've asked BMW so I could drive the rear-wheel drive variant of that M340i for literally years. And BMW, much like Audi, is terrible at getting us cars. They try their best, but the Midwest is not a priority. So there you go. Uh, no. I know. Because we're not real America here. <laughs> <laughs> like, whenever we go to these press events, because every press event is in California, yep. like, it started to trigger me more and more. I'm not, like, a big, like, stumping for the Midwest, because let's face it, our weather sucks. It's, there's nothing really to do here. The people are pretty real down to earth, but it's not like, oh my God, you got to move to Illinois. Nobody says that. It's like the Joachim, Joachim Noah thing about uh, when he was on the Bulls, he joked around about what's so great, great about Cleveland. Yeah. Nobody says they take their vacation to Cleveland. Like, <laughs> it's it's true. Nobody's like, oh, I got to I gotta come to I Illinois. I got to hang out in the northwest yeah. suburbs of Jack and Mark. Uh, but they, it pisses me off because it's always like, the whole world doesn't revolve around California. California's like mentality of how cars work there and people work there. It, it's, it's so removed from reality of the rest of the country, especially the rural areas more so. Um, okay, now I just lost every... Oh, we just got quiet because we realized you just sacrificed your entire relationship with California. <laughs> it just fell into the ocean for you. Um, all right. Uh, Mark, can you share your experiences with music streaming service, Tidal versus Amazon Music? Um, like what, what do you use? I use Spotify because I'm a basic bitch and Mark uses Amazon because he loves Jeff Bezos. It's because I want one service where I don't have 10 different subscriptions. Once Amazon went to like lossless yeah. or near lossless audio, I was good for that. I mean, it's already tied into Prime and all do of I that crap. Like five minute NPR beat. Uh, every you you do get like Spotify is better, but Spotify originally you could only sign up with an account if you had a Facebook account. Do you remember doing that? No. Like they were heavily integrated into Facebook, and I'm just like anti. Yeah, like, like met, met, even though I have an Instagram thing for Savage Geese. But anyway, it's it's nonsense. Um, <laughs> can you, Michael, ask Mark? Can you comment on the? Historical aspect of new slash used car affordability. Where do you think the market will be in five, ten years from now? For background, I'm in my mid-20s with a well above average salary, and I could not I still had to drop out of the market because I couldn't swallow paying forty thousand dollars for an Elantra N or fifty thousand dollars for a GR Corolla or Type R. You answer that. I I mean you know how I feel about it. Cars are a shitload of money now, and I, they are going to get more money, they're, go they're going to continue to cost more till people stop buying cars. And I think that's just going to be the way it is. Used vehicles, I think, because of interest rates, the way they are going will come down in price out of necessity. But I, I honestly, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for it. When it comes to reliability, though, and the concerns when it comes to uh, like how these vehicles are going to hold up, they're going to be a lot more expensive to repair than they used to be, particularly as all these vehicles move towards hybridization and EVs. 
I think that because of the repair cost, used car prices for more commodity vehicles will come down, but that's it. Yeah, I think you're going to see a correction this year. I mean, you're already starting to see it in used car prices. So once that kind of tanks, you know, then inventories come back up and nobody wants to pay 7% interest on car loans like average the people. The reason why there's no T in my alphabet is all the T is in me. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, that was horrible. Forgive me. Uh, Mark. Oh, you don't, you haven't transitioned. Look, this is probably the, the only uh, female that's on here that's fake. <laughs> Uh, um, I, I had to, I had to do it. Oh wait a second! Hold on a second, Jack. Let me get this banner up because it's yeah. <laughs> um, what's your uh, what is mine and Mark's favorite coffee beverage? And is there a spot open for a grumpy cameo from Scott? Okay, uh, so first let's do the drink one. All right, let's you start. I'd... I am a cappuccino or latte man. How about you, Mark? That's it? Yeah, like a I thought you like a whole bunch of stuff. I do. I like I like some fruit fruit drinks, but now I'm 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 going hard on the pure like latte or cappuccino. I have an arrow press at home so every morning. <laughs> I I would love to do you really? Yeah, I do. Oh my god, I thought you were joking. <laughs> no, I should have known. Bougie. I should have known. Uh, I'm in there with my, my farm-to-table beans, grinding them up every morning while I sit there with my apron on. Uh, what about you, Mark? I, so Mark does have a dairy intolerance, so he's, he's moved from uh, soy to oat. Uh, yeah, so the, the back story about this, to take a break from the questions, is I used to work at Motorola back in the day, and this was like Greg and all them, yeah. and it was like 10 of us guys. <laughs> and this is when Motorola was like Motorola before it was uh, Lenovo, and they were just like, they were done. Like they were done and nobody cared about anything. So we'd come into work and they, cause we were contractors at that point, they literally took our IT team and they didn't know where to put us. So they put us in the law department with all these Motorola lawyers and we were so obnoxious that they kicked us out of the department. <laughs> Literally had the, the like the facilities guys come move our cubes out and they put us in the main hallway in the building. Like when you walked out, they just built our cubes in the hallway because they didn't want us to be around anybody else. So we'd go and like, screw it, none of the management cares. So we'd go on like four hour lunches. Like literally we would only come into work to go to lunch, to hang out because everything else was like a shit show. So we'd go to lunch. First we'd go bowling and then we'd go like, let's get like an appetizer and then we'd go get lunch and then we'd go somewhere else and then we'd go get ice cream every day. And it was like a course of a year of getting like hot fudge sundaes and turtle sundaes and banana splits that like one day my buddy Greg, he had his, his family's like uh, exploder and it was like brand new in the leather, that fake leather smell. I, I had this gurgling in my stomach and they literally had to pull over at a gas station. I barely made it in. That was the turning point for me. After that day, every time I had dairy, I was like done for, but it was like years of abuse, <laughs> like literally years of abuse. So uh, now I don't like coffee. So I just drink chives with oat milk and it's as close as I can get to my dairy fix. Uh, Jake E asks, <laughs> any updates on a long-term MDX type S? We have that vehicle. Uh, We're going to be doing a series of videos. We have two long-term testers right now that uh, OEMs gave us. We have a Mazda 3 all-wheel drive turbo. I can't tell you how many times people have asked us to do a long-term current-gen Mazda 3. We talked to Mazda about it. They gave us a loan for six months, so we're gonna try to pile on like 20,000 miles in six months. I'll let you know how that goes, but... Oh, I, that's what I forgot to upload, that, the one clip. Um, I might be able to upload it um, for people to see about the transmission thing? Oh, yeah, so the Type S has a gearbox problem. It goes into neutral all the time, which we'll be talking about in our actual video when that com uh, comes out. Yeah, I'm not gonna put it in. And our that. Mazda 3, uh, it's a brand new vehicle. It's an all-wheel drive turbo, every single option because it's a press car, that's how it works. It already has a horrendous headliner rattle, but you know, you're about to see what's gonna happen with that vehicle long-term. Mar I did bring it in for the transmission issue because I had a flat and tire. Like, dead, no the, the, like I literally talked to three people there. I I said this is a press car. It's automotive media and it's from the manufacturer. Can you please take a look at this? If the if the trans ECU needs to be reset for like relearn, um, I talked to the the tech. I talked to the service manager and I talked to the the main guy who handles service calls. 
And they're like, oh, everything's all done. I'm like, oh, so what was it, the trans? He's like, the text just like, oh, it does that in sport mode. I'm like, yeah, that's not what I said. And it happens in every mode. It doesn't matter what, it, in comfort mode, it does it. So they basically didn't do anything. So I'm going to see, uh, once I record it, I'll go back and bring it back and kind of really be like, hey, what is really wrong with this? Is it from the factory that way or is it just a problem? But anyway, yeah. Uh, Dan, who is a hero, I'm sorry, Chris, I'll answer Chris, I'll ask, answer, uh, answer Chris's question first. What do you miss most about your LC500? Do you regret getting rid of it? Uh, I miss that car a lot, um, but I didn't, I didn't drive it. It was a car I really wanted. I thought it was like, it was everything I wanted in a car at that point in time. You but drove the hell out of that thing. Dude, I drove that thing like none other, and it wasn't designed to drive it the way that I did, and I think that's what broke it for me, is we went to the track a couple of times, not <laughs> not because it was my plan to do that, I just wanted to see what it was like, and when we were out there with Jack's vet, his uh, Grand Sport, the thing was fast. It really was fast. It would fast. pull on the straights on the Grand Sport. Yeah, I mean, and I drove the, the piss out of it, but the problem was is it didn't have the cooling to support its capabilities. It needs stiffer suspension, like a better suspension to control the weight. It needed a trans cooler and it needed an oil cooler. All three of those things would not be the biggest deal to do and I would buy another one, but I would not buy it without that because I'd always get to the threshold of having that He'd oil. be out there for like 10 or 15 minutes and would overheat. No, it wasn't even that in the heat. Like it would literally like five be minutes. four laps <laughs> of me driving and the trans would reach its peak so 20 and minutes, oil. So because that's how long it takes Well, to yeah, do. right. No, the oil, would, the oil would be in red like every time I drove it. Uh, Dan, who is a hero, and thank you, Dan, for being a long-term supporter of this channel. Uh, long-term plans for Savage Geese. Have you considered moving to warmer climates? Both of our significant others and families are out here in the Midwest, so that's pretty much where we're stuck. Uh, posting to different platforms such as Rumble. Um, we post to... I think we're going to start posting on Amazon again. And... Um, uh, our stuff is about to go up on Samsung, assuming that goes through. But not really. I mean, YouTube is sort of our home. I mean, if this outlet or platform dies, and for whatever reason we continue to do this, we'll probably move to another platform. But I think, you know, what, well, what are your thoughts Let's be honest, on you, ain't, you ain't moving to another platform. If this does, yeah, Jack's going to Yeah, I'm going back to corporate work, <laughs> yelling at all my employees yeah. and my factories. Jack's going to have a job in the corporate world, and I'm going to ride this out until it absolutely crumbles to the ground. And then going to live in my yard. Yeah, I'm going to, like, live in Jack's basement, that's for sure. My goal, like, there's days where I, and Jack and I have this conversation, and it's a real conversation to have. Um, doing this six to seven days a week is not fun. A lot and the the amount of stress personally that I'm under to make this work and then work and then try to be creative I, I wake up days and I'm like I just want to go back to my corporate job it was it was easy not like easy like I talked about the Motorola story my corporate jobs that was that's not how it was really like all the time. <laughs> you weren't the IT director I, that I just disappeared I, I gotta play golf I gotta go I gotta fund the local ice cream shop this week um, my real my real jobs were hard, but they were never as hard as this. I mean, I, I just don't get a break. So anyway, uh, um, expansion of Savage Geese. My goal was more projects. Our goal this year is to do one docu style film or big video every single month. That's why you guys watch this stuff. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. We have a lot of big projects that are hopefully going to come through, and you'll see a lot more like the C eight Z O six docu film or the the Nissan Z film or any of those big videos where you see engineers and people and we try to tell you a story that's a little bit more timeless and less disposable than a lot of the standard review or content that is put out on the internet. Um, perhaps more satirical content. Yeah, why not? We have, we're trying to do Wednesday videos from now on where we'll, uh, they're gonna be topical or be a little bit less formal. Uh, we're never going to do skits or anything like that, but that's not who we are. I, I mean, I, I could easily do skits. The Tom Todd stuff was hilarious. You know, yeah. I mean, that's the type I'm of rich, stuff that I would do. A problem. Yeah, I mean, there's some classic stuff to do, but to, to keep up that shtick in every video becomes like, it. it be, I can't do that. Like, it has to be very metered out, and people are not watching at least our stuff for the comedy. Yeah, no and, one likes us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they might like the sarcasm to a certain extent and some of the bullshit that's in it. If it was me, I would have like probably 500 people watching because I'd be such an asshole all the time, but I have to dial it back, especially with this guy. Uh, when the Bronco video comes out, like it's coming out Friday, and yeah. you'll see like I'm such a dick in the shop, and I, I cut it together where every time I had a snide comment, and Jack is just like completely ignoring me so he can get back <laughs> to like the actual business. That's what it's like. <laughs> Uh, today in the shop, we were talking about uh, something, and it dawned on me. I'm like, man, 
when I'm like 45 and I'm burnt out with life, I'm, and I'm a pure businessman, I'm going to be such an asshole. Yeah, yeah, you add another like 10, oh, well, this is the thing, like when you're young, you have a different mentality, you have a lot more tolerance for stuff, and then you tack on every 10 years, you're like a totally different person, more so with business, and depending on your relationships, you're going to put up with less. If you're on your fifth divorce, you know. Oh, I'm only 17. You're, you know, you're not there yet. You know, you're going to clearly look at this person and be like, I, the first time there's a whiff of like drama, you're like, see ya. Oh, Mark's always like, oh, the old ball and chain. Yeah, yeah. Well, did you see uh, the lady from Amazon? Or what's the, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name. The guy that was, the, the guy, the girl who was married to Bezos, she got remarried and I guess she's getting divorced for the second time already. Like, you know, she's probably like, yeah. <laughs> you know, now I, I don't need these it's guys. It's easier to pull the ripcord. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you think the industry will shift from cars to trucks? Is it indicative um, of a post-apocalyptic world where roads don't exist? Uh, that's a good question. Honestly, Dan, I think the reason why people are pushed towards trucks and SUVs versus cars is purely a utility perspective and packaging. You look at the new Ram EV. I know Dan doesn't like EVs, but that thing is the size of a... Is, it's not going to look like the concept vehicle. I would be shocked if it looked anything like the concept vehicle. But that thing is enormous. And, yeah, it's huge. Be, and because it's so big, uh, they, there's so much more utility and flexibility for the OEM. Now a truck or an SUV can be that everything vehicle. So, um, all right. Scott, what do you think of the best? What do you think the best Porsche purchase would be as a driver's car investment for 30k or close? Must be a manual transmission. You think these cars will ever return to prices like they were two, three years ago? Um, probably, honestly, investments hard because all cars are, for the most part, bad investments. But something that isn't going to just crater into the ground value wise. I don't know, like a you're going to hear this from everyone, Cayman or maybe a 996, 911 if the IMS bearings were done. It's just, they're a lot of money. And that's the other thing. You're buying a car that's $30,000. Now, if anything bad happens to that Porsche, when we do our Cayman video or 987.2, it may be thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 now. That car was you know, a nearly a six-figure vehicle when it was new, particularly when you included inflation. So some, some, if something bad happens... You are going to have a bad time financially. It's going to be a lot worse than a traditional $30,000 car to fix. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, I'll ask, you know, as a premium Patreon member, <laughs> uh, are we going to do any fan meetup events like we did at TMP several years ago? I am working with Chicago Auto Pros and Autobahn as we speak on doing a track day autocross car show viewer meetup at Autobahn sometime this spring or summer. Uh, the proceeds will go, so the proceeds that don't cover the track rental, so it's gonna be run by Chicago Auto Pros, but the car show element and the gate fees, I'm trying to make sure all of the autocross fees as well go to a local animal charity, a dog charity, because I'm a dog person. and. Pets, pets are amazing. I'm going to let you run with that, dude, because... Uh, He's I, not going to run the event, but he will be there. We're trying to get some other YouTubers to be there as well. The track day, the autocross should be fun. It'll be at Autobahn. Um, yeah. All right. So there's that. Uh, what are your top five manual transmissions? This is from Eric Lowe. Uh well, since I am <coughs> paid for by Honda. CTR, CTR. Yes, yeah, yeah, Civic Integra Type R, Civic Type R, the FL5 Type R, and even if you moved, you could... Civic SI. Size. Civic, yeah, no. Uh, I think the best ones, modern history, are the GT350, or whatever. Yeah, GT350, yeah. the Tremec, 60, TR6060, so it would be the similar shit in the Camaro, right? I mean... Yeah, yeah. the... To me, it's GT350. It's yeah. the GT3s. They basically feel the same. 9.1.2 yeah. and 992. Uh, current FL5 CTR, no joke. It's a As really, a front-wheel drive car. It's a yeah. very good gearbox. Uh, Hellcat. Yeah, yeah, surprisingly. It's very industrial, but, but it's, it's very, amazing. very mechanical. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. But I guess you could say the same thing about like, the Viper, Viper transmission. Yep. It's like, it's got that same, like... It, it's a perfect transmission for Jack because, well, maybe not so much now. You smoothed out your your shifting, but before, you know, this guy was like 
uh, a robot arm, you know, in a factory. It's like <laughs> For just, my MT-82 with my MGW. Yeah, yeah, the guy shotgun blasts it. And I would say that's 2000 is probably one of the best, despite it being a little bit finicky. Blackwing gearbox. Blackwing gearbox. V, but that's another Tremec That's unit. another Tremec like unit. It. Yeah, that's it for me. Um, all right. There are quite a few more, so hopefully people don't totally disappear from this. Um, love that you... Uh, this is from Chris Rice. I love you going to say got, Chris Rock. Yeah, this is from Chris Rock. So don't hit me. Uh, love what you did with the GR86 versus Super versus Z on the same tire and braking upgrades. Would love uh, enjoying seeing more of those comparison tests uh, on older, lightly modified sports cars. Honestly, we have some compar- t- comparison tests coming up, and they're all going to be in RE71 RSs. I don't know about older cars, because that involves getting viewers involved and having their cars modified and all that other fun stuff. Um, our comparison tests, no surprise, we're trying to do a GR Corolla, a Launcher N, CTR, Golf R video. We have that 4-liter that is double wishbone from Germany and the uh, Corvette one coming along and a couple others this year. I'm trying to do one with the manual Supra and a couple other vehicles, but I know people like them. It's an easy one, and I like the philosophical element. Britt, who um, is still sort of the lead instructor at Autobahn Country Club, is a tremendous driver, and he does give very, very good feedback, and he's very consistent. So I know you guys like it, so we're going to try to put those together. They are a bear to make, though. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's it's like 10 times longer. But, I mean, it's like anything enthusiast-related, right? Like, when when you're catering to an enthusiast, like, there's a different level of expectation for those types of cars versus, like, a commodity thing. Like, we could shit out, like, the Equinox that we have right now. Speaking of which, we're going to take a quick break uh, and show you... This is, a, this is an exclusive live stream review that I'm going to play for everybody right now. Blake and Timmy from TikTok begged me to do a video on my brand new uh, Chevy Equinox here. We have the Chevy Equinox with two gauge clusters. There's a speedometer here, and then this is telling me how fast the engine is going. Um, so this, when this goes high, the engine's going really fast. We have a, a, a fuel economy meter here, and this is whether I'm hot or cold. So what we do is we can hit this button, and it'll turn on the heat, and then the airbags heat up just in case there's an accident. We come over here, and this is a, one of my favorite touches, everybody. This is the badass bow tie right here that they put on the shifter. So when I shift down, um, it's a little hard to shift. Um, I guess I just need to go to the gym or something, guys. Uh, so there's a this button here is uh, hidden behind the shifter. It's a sport mode button. So you hit it, and it flashes, and it lets you know that you're ready to go. This is a great place for chai lattes. Um, I get oat milk in mine or typically soy when I feel like I'm having a little bit more of uh, feelings towards somebody I, I I feel a little bit extra charged so I have a soy latte and it just dials me back to the next level so I can talk about maybe cuddling I, I'm not sure but anyway there's two cup holders and then we get to the crown jewel of the Equinox interior this is the 17 inch touchscreen display everyone and uh, if i want to listen to music it's very easy to navigate it's like my home screen at at home when i touch i just control everything through here so when i'm listening um, it's a little little loud for everybody that's my friend's music he likes to listen to that headbanger stuff i'm i'm more into classic vinyl myself i have a couple record players at home and um, I think it just sounds better than CD. But I think anyway, aside from that, we got a lot of features I'll cover in the next video. Everybody catch you later. I can't believe I work with this guy. <laughs> and really, that was just a clever way of catching up with like with the comments. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Um, oh, shit. Uh, let me get back to anyway, you. so my point of commodity cars, it's way easier to do a shitbox Equinox where nobody literally cares about production value or anything. You just They just want yeah, to hear... just make a TikTok video? Yeah, that's it. Man, we got a lot more questions. Uh, so we are doing a Discord. It is all set up. We just need to activate it, and we haven't had time to activate a Discord and actually make sure that it's moderated correctly and it doesn't turn into an internet hellscape. But yes, we do have a Discord. Um, after working as a service advisor for BMW for 15 years, 
it seems only two concerns customers have anymore. Why isn't my Apple CarPlay working and why do I need brakes and tires already? Are you guys privy to engineering advances in tire compounds that will allow them to hold up to better uh, <coughs> hold up better to instant torque being created by fully hybridized and fully electric motors? Um, to be honest, I think that's the biggest problem that both roads, tires, and consumables are going to have is as everything moves to EV trucks and big EV SUVs, you're going to see a massive increase in consumable cost because tires are going to wear out faster. Brakes won't, but I think a lot of suspension components and road damage is going to get worse. Yeah. I think the tire problem, you're just going to see tires get replaced sooner. We're doing a video, and it's my fault for not having it out and scripted yet, but we're doing a technical series with Bridgestone. It's not sponsored by Bridgestone. They were the only tire company to ever say yes to answering our engineering questions in great detail on summer tire technology, walking you through technically the differences in how tread blocks work, how different rubber compounds work, why tires wear the way they do, and one on snow tires, and quite frankly, how all season tires have advanced to the point where, well, you should always get snow tires, how they are now more, let's call it, a jack of all trades, no pun intended, how they have a broader bandwidth yeah. of use. Well, the, the other part too is you have cars that are bigger, like everything's bigger and heavier, and this was going back to a point I was talking to you in the shop today. Um, you know, it's funny going back to older cars that had an average weight of 3,000 pounds. Now everything's gone up to like 3,500 or like 4,000 pounds because everybody wants an SUV. And that was kind of like the, the light car, fun to car thing was phased out based on people's desire to have bigger vehicles. So now like the concept of like what Lotus was doing or like McLaren, you can forget about that because it's too expensive. Nobody buys it. Um, now we have the regulations kind of killing off uh, internal combustion or like fun internal combustion for like these downsized engines. And now we're seeing like all these EV pushes. So EVs are way heavier. They're like twice the weight of an old, you know, the older cars. And you have like concepts now coming out like the Ram. We we're talking about that today. The concept of a three row pickup truck, which you know 100% is going to happen. So you're talking about now a, a 9,000 pound truck. Three row truck, bigger, heavier in every capacity, more materials, huge batteries. And that's like three cars based on our, our old cars that they used to be. So to power that level of weight and to power that level of horsepower and torque, you have bigger tires, bigger and bigger tires. And they have to be stickier to put down the power, which means you can't have both. You can't have an all season compound that can control that type of weight and load and lateral load and a, like longitudinal load on an all season tire. So more of these tires are becoming more and more separated to summer and now they're having an all season option and they literally get obliterated in 20,000 miles, if that. So you're gonna see this on more and more products as the, the especially with the EVs because there's no way they can manage power without the electronics on the tire. Uh, and now tires are crazy. Like that uh, RDX tire was $450 for an all season. MDX. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, the MDX. I mean, $450 for one tire. And this is really common now to see tires over 250 or 300 on these mainstream cars per tire. That's a huge consumable cost that people don't think about. And it's one thing, obviously the viewers on here know to look at that. Like if you're gonna buy a car, look at what the tires cost before you get into it. And you're like, oh shit. Like me with the back seven, I'm like, Jack's like, well, I can get you tires. I'm like, yeah, there's really only ty two tire options that are made for that car, two. One's a summer and one's a half-ass all season. And they're all like $500 a piece. And I'm like, dude, I'm not spending Two thousand, like twenty four hundred dollars for winter tires. So I'm just not going to drive. Oh, you it. should get some Cup Two Rs on yeah, the thing instead. I mean, but that's next. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, all right, I'm going to answer a couple more Patreon questions. Um, Joseph, who's a GT4 owner, is thinking about going to a one car garage again. Uh, thoughts on the G80, G82 M3, or maybe is that the M2? I can't remember if that's the M3 or the M2. We're doing an M2 video, so I can answer that question in the future. But uh, the M3 compared to a GT4 is going to feel awfully numb, but a whole lot faster. Yeah, for sure. Yep. I don't think you'll be all that happy, man. If I went from a GT4 to a, uh, a M3, I mean, yeah, the practicality will be great, and having a less substantial payment would be great. Yeah. But the car is really numb. Uh, bup, 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 bup. Uh, Jeffrey. Uh, with Model 3 prices falling, is there a better choice over 
you is it a better choice over used hybrid or plug-in hybrid vehicles looking at a model 3 versus an es 300 hybrid honda clarity or honda accord hybrid you had a gentleman that you used to work with who had a model 3 for three years in the midwest you want to walk him through yeah that so i met up with my ex-co-workers and uh he leased a model 3 and he I, I don't know. He didn't have the extended range. He had the regular one. So at the end of three years, he was done with it because of the range anxiety. And I'm like, okay, well, that's everybody that, you know. So he started with like a 220 mile range. By the end of three years, he barely got 170. And every time he got down to like that 10, 15 mile range, it was reducing the power uh, output of the car. And granted, he drove it pretty hard, but he's like, I'm never doing that again. So the, the batteries regardless of Tesla, even though all the updates, there's going to be degradation depending on the weather that you're in. We talk about this all the time. People like don't talk about it, but if you're in cold or extreme hot and you drive it hard and you're constantly up and down, up and down on that battery, or if you're like, you're on a fast charger all the time, there's going to be degradation. They so, try to build it in the packs. Like they build overhead in the packs for that, you know, to, to make up for it, but it's still there. So can you live with that, with the model three, the compromise associated with it, or would you rather pay for gas just buy an ES300 or a yeah. Honda Accord, which, you know, while they will not be essentially free to run in that regards, they won't have those long-term issues and give you some more flexibility. I would buy the ES, personally, or the Honda Accord, if you're looking for that frugal McDougal pseudo-luxury car to roll around in, but... Yeah. Uh, all right, I'll answer. I know there are a ton of questions from Super Chat, but I'll go through a couple more uh, Patreon questions, and we'll go back to them later. Holy crap. Uh, sorry, guys, there's just a lot of questions. Um, unrelated to cars, Mark, what messaging app do you recommend for privacy? Well, I use Threema, and it's kind of like like Signal and all of those that aren't, you know, there's a lot of other ones that have been publicized, but Threema is probably the best in terms of security. They have Threema for business, and then Threema is only paid. You can't get it for free, and it's cheap, but... It's encrypted end to end, uh, you know. So like my, it's, you're not going to use Grinder. No, I'm not going <laughs> to use Grinder. So anyway, yeah, I, I'm not going to give you the technical breakdown, but I use Threema personally. There's a lot of benefits to it, and if you know how to like make sure your phone is secure, it should be safe. You have to make sure that you have a, a password set on your phone or encryption, especially on iPhone, because it uses that. If you don't have that set, then people can get into the database of the phone and steal it. So again, like everything, you have to do your due diligence to protect your data. Uh, if you could only choose one fun, manual-only Japanese-German car to have as a second car to drive and hold on to for 10 to 20 years, what would it be, assuming your max budget is like $65,000? You, you tell <clears> me, bro. Uh, that's 60000 is hard for me. Because, I, no. I, I mean, I, my, most of my cars are like four fifty, five hundred thousand. dollars <laughs> I, my influencer money comes oh, in. Oh, man, it's incredible. Because I, I did a commercial for a Type R. Man, a Type R. There and you go. I spent two days and didn't get a dollar. Um, two, uh, man, second car makes it hard because that to me that rules out things like the Type R, joking aside, and some of the four-door piles. <sighs> 10 to 20 years. And you want German or American, I'm sorry, German or Japanese. I mean, uh, ND Miata. Yeah, that's, I, I hate to say, it, be that guy. Or I, honestly, I'd buy American at that price point. I mean, for 60 to 70 I mean, under $65,000 and you want to keep it for a long time, a vet or a Viper would be amazing for that money. A vet, a Viper would be even better. I mean, honestly. If you get like a Gen 4 Viper, as much as I didn't love that thing, it's already old. You're going to have a unique experience for over a decade. Or like a, a C6Z06 or something yeah, along those Yeah, no, lines. Good, good point. Oh, you, you're going to show I'm, them like video? Somebody, somebody mentioned uh, the Threema article on Ars Technica, which I did not see yesterday. I just want to see what they say. Like, it's probably going to be like, oh, Threema just shit the bed. Oh, there's vulnerabilities with Threema now? I, I, don't, I don't know. All right, I, I, let I me go look. back to uh, more... Oh, um, something that I will bring up that someone asked me earlier on Patreon. Um, as far as collaborations with OEMs, not OEMs, uh, other YouTubers go... Um, We've, we did one recently with a journalist outlet for the Kia EV6 GT. I'm, I'm open to do more in the future. I think we're going to do one with George at Moto Man. And uh, one of these days we'll have um, Deb at a press event with us where we'll shoot a video. Um, we're, we're not opposed to it. It just becomes a logistic 
headache and with how tight our schedule is. We also are doing a Mark IV Super video. If there's any chance that Albon is watching this currently, Goff at Albon. We shot our Mark IV Super video with Al- Albon. That's basically done. We just need to shoot some of yeah. our B-roll and shoot our shop segment. But you'll be seeing that in the next month or so. That will be a good one. I know you guys have been asking for a long, long time. Uh, two more Patreons, Mark, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to... The main questions. The main questions. Oh, my God. Trying to pick ones that... After the CRX video, I got really interested in an affordable driver's car. What is a good older driver's car that you can actually buy, such as an older Civic, etc.? What about what do you think, Mark? As I pull you away from sorry, I, like this is a, now I'm, I'm actually reading too deeply into this. But yeah, I'll read this later. Um, uh, the three most stuff is interesting. I'll have to go through it more. I mean, of course, there's going to be two sides of the research versus what the company says, and I'll be curious to see. It, what's real and what's not with that. Anyway, back to back to the question. Affordable <laughs> car that's a driver's car that's old. Driver. That you can actually find. Like an S2000 is an affordable driver's car, but it doesn't have the steering feel or anything like that. I mean, and you can find an Elise. I mean, I don't know what shape they are. I mean, if you want the what's best... What's affordable? An Elise is expensive. Like 40 grand? No. Or 20,000. Well, I don't know. 20,000? A Miata? Yeah, that's pretty much like an NC... Yeah, and see, Miata is probably your best bet for, for real-wheel like, drive. And do you think that offers some of the feel of something like an Integra or something older, like a CRX? No, but I mean, it's, you can't find CRX. Yeah, I mean, those are you know those are shit. You boxes can't find Integras way. either. Yeah, no, don't even bother. They're not worth the money to buy them. You know, like we rave about them as a, like in these in these videos, like the CRX. That CRX SI we did was like sixty thousand dollars. SIR. SIR. It's probably more than that. I bet you if you posted it up, somebody would pay like ninety thousand dollars for it. Yeah, and like Integras, nice ones that aren't like four owner. Every single one of them totaled out and stolen are almost six figure cars now. It's crazy. RX seven mentioned. That's also. A pretty amazing car. But a great it, a, car. Actually, it's a really great car. It's just it takes a lot more work to to get it right than it would a traditional like four popper. I think if you own an RX seven, you're someone who's willing to wrench on a car. And while I don't have a problem if you're willing to do that, I think for a regular person that becomes not necessarily the most realistic. Um, how do I explain? Last one. This will be my, my my last of the Patreon questions. I want to hit you up on one that's actually uh, a good one. Not, not that they aren't good, but you know, one that will apply to many, many people. Here's a philosophical one from Peter Chu. Will Acura hybridize your CUV SUV lineup? And I think this becomes a... <sighs> Acura and Honda are in a weird spot. Do you think... I mean, they're going to have to hybridize RDX and MDX and all this stuff. Do you think they are going to be successful in that market? And you see that anytime soon? Because clearly, like, CRV is a hybrid pile. Now. Yeah, right. Accord is a hybrid pile. They just, Acura Honda doesn't have a lot of drivetrains. I think people forget that. They have the 1.5, the 2 liter, a naturally aspirated 2. They're hybrid in their four cylinder guys and 1V6 that's modern, the 3 liter, and then the 3.5. They don't have a lot of drivetrains to work with, right. so they're going to have to ground up a premium hybrid. Yeah, no, you're right. I, I mean, that, that's, that's the truth of it. Okay, all right, let's start answering uh, Super Chat questions. Mark, you want to start hitting me up with the about a billion of them that we've gotten so far? All right, first one. Mini Bike Madness, thank you for the $1 donation, sir. Thank you, sir. That's, a, that's your type of bike there. Was it a Honda 50? It is a Honda 50. Are you going to do wheelies on that? I would love to. I still desperately want to put you on a motorcycle, like even in a sidecar. I, I still think one of the most entertaining videos we've done, the likelihood of the, the viewer who gave us the uh, vehicle to be on here is like zero, but the Morgan 3, I love that thing so much. I know you did. I, I mean, uh, the 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 only time I was ever on a bike was on my buddy's dirt bike. He's like, oh, let me take did you, you on my dirt bike. No, he put me on the back of his dirt bike, and I was holding on to him like in, in bitch mode. <laughs> and I was like terrified. That was the only time I ever like got on a bike like that yeah. as a, a passenger. Uh, but you can count me out of that, dude. I'd be dead in two seconds on a bike. Dead. <laughs> You'd be scraping me off the, a guardrail or something. Uh, next comment. Uh <laughs> LT Automotive, thank you for your $5 donation. 
I'd like to have, uh, I'd, I'd have more to give if I didn't owe $1,000 a month for the next eight years on my pre-owned <laughs> Ultima. That's some strong Nissan financing, sir. Yeah, that's, that's, that's premium financing. Josh, thank you for the $20. Thank you, sir. I am torn between contributing to my 401k or being an American and buying a car that costs my entire salary. Alfa Romeo Giulia, if you've driven the TI even cooler. We did have a TI as a press car. We we didn't do a video on it. It was, uh, it was the like British racing green one, too. Yeah, remember? you kept me away from that vehicle. And it was brown interior. Uh, it's a cool car. I, I just It's one that you really love to drive it because the chassis is amazing, but it's such a small car on the inside for what it is. Uh, and then I say this every live stream. You have to see if you like the engine because... That engine is just the four popper. It, it's it's average. You know, like there's nothing wrong with it, but it's like it's such a good car that you can't really utilize what the chassis is, and you just always want more out of it. I don't think it'd be worth going in hock for it to spend a lot of money. Yep. That's just my I'm personally. sure used though. I'm sure they're dirt. Oh cheap. yeah, now they are. I think the the Julia and the Stelvio, like last time I looked, were hilarious in oh, terms of poor resale value like 25 grand or 30 grand I, I don't know what they were but they were like way way less as he as he used so if you could get one like i don't even know if they do certified and how many dealerships actually service them that's the other thing is how many uh alpha dealerships are around now five <laughs> <laughs> all right next one uh pavel jones thank you for the ten dollars australian much love from australia i hope mark is enjoying his ctr I have an FL5 allocation coming in April and wanted to set aside aftermarket rims. What rims or wheels look best on an FL5 in your opinion? Uh, for the sake of Scott, the Mugen wheels are amazing. I don't know, man. They're, they're... I, I don't like bronze wheels. I've never liked bronze wheels. It's just, it's like a Subaru thing to me. Like I always saw it on a Subaru or Evos. Joking aside. Um... I mean, that those car, those wheels are classic. They're But that obviously fits the Apex wheel that they're working on or have one? Uh, they have them out. Um, yo at Apex. The thing I like about Apex wheels, they don't pay us to say this or anything along those lines. Is they view No, wheel. you're making an ad now. You're making a commercial for them, aren't you? <sighs> I got to pay for my factory expansion. Come on, yo. No, the thing about uh, Apex is they view wheels as consumables, and if you talk to anyone who actually drives their cars hard, wheels are consumable. They break, they crack. If you ride curbs on tracks, blah, blah, blah. So Apex will sell you your next set of wheels after you inevitably destroy your first set for half off, which is a big deal. And the wheels are not catastrophically expensive. They're not like $4,000 a set, at least for their cast wheels. So you have a coupon code, too, to go with that? Yeah. Or you get what? How Jack much? Factory is the... Uh, yeah, if you buy them for 50% off, then we get a cut of like 1,000%. And Jack's going to buy another Corvette, so I have to hear about it again for another year. <laughs> Yeah. This dude buys a Corvette like three years ago. I still just stopped. I finally stopped hearing about it because he was over it. And now he's started over the thing with the, the Corvette again. And now every day, we can't even have a normal conversation with this guy anymore. All he does, oh, man, have you seen my Corvette in the garage? It's just sitting there. It's killing me. Oh. Um, Savage Fleece. That is a great name. Uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, hit me up with the next question, sir. Sorry, I'm kind of stuck here. With oh, that. yeah, Jack likes to talk about Corvettes. That was that was the next question. Uh, here we go. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we addressed that in the beginning of the video. I think Mark. Uh, I talked Mark about wishes, it for 20 minutes. So I think if you Mark want wishes to go he back, did that differently. Just just rewind it, and you'll see it was not an advertisement. I'm going to say that, and if there's any other super chat things paying me to answer this, it was not an advertisement. I put them in the video because I wanted to, and then I botched the story so it wound up looking like an ad. And not only I, I pissed a lot of viewers off, I made the dealership like have to deal with about a bunch of bad press. So, Good job, Mark. Yeah, anyway. Next question. Uh, glad to see Mark rocking the Kirkland signature hoodie. Oh, we answered this We answered earlier. this, so we'll, we'll answer it again. The WRX is a fine car. It's still a Subaru. It's better than the last one. It's just uglier, but it's... It is ugly. And the interior is crap. And it's ugly. But it drives well. Maybe when they decide they're going to paint the fucking parts on it and it doesn't look like a... You don't have to go to the aftermarket? You, like you, I sent you the picture. I sent Jack a picture today from the new... They're Rivian, right? Yeah. The Rivian Amazon trucks that are on the road. 
If you look at the side of it, like they put all this plastic cladding, unpainted plastic, obviously for durability and easy to replace. And it looked just like the CX-30 on the side, like the bottom half. So now the CX-30 is going to probably sell a lot more because people are like, oh man, I want, I want my SUV to look like an Amazon delivery truck. <laughs> Next question, sir. Uh, any, we answered that one as well. Okay. Forgetful Foot, thank you for the $2. You'll be seeing a 987.2 Cayman S video in the next month or so. Not from me. Uh, Adam, thank you for the $50. That Adam. Is very, 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 very kind, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate it. And thank you to everybody. It's not just, the money is not the, the issue here. It's just, I have to, this is helping me deal with Jack after this. He's going to beat the shit out of me and tell me I'm <laughs> a bad businessman. Um... Oh, Rick, oh, that's going to get me a bag. Yeah, thank you, Rick, again for the $10. I told, I, I said thank you to Rick in the very beginning. What's, uh, how much is a regular beef and cheddar now? Three ninety nine, dollars or is it? You're asking the wrong person. I missed your AeroPress in the morning, remember? All right. This is a true story. When we were filming the Z06 piece and we were in Kentucky, all this guy talked about with our poor rep and all the engineers is like, Man, I need to get this jack guy over to Checkers. He's going to expand his palate. I shit you not. My rep still talks about that. One of our Porsche reps, nice, nice lady. She messaged. Lady, she's like 20, or she's like 18 years old. <laughs> nice human being. She's like, ah, oh, uh, you know, next time you're in Georgia, we, I, we, we should get burgers. Tell Mark it's not McDonald's. Yeah, I, I, he's developed a reputation with all the reps that all he wants to do is eat garbage. It, it's funny because I'm not into that. I like good food, but I'm also realistic. Like, I I don't want to go and blow one hundred and fifty dollars for some bougie ass food when I have like two minutes to eat. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. like I'll, I'll do checkers and I'll, <laughs> I'll be in the bathroom all night, but I'll do it. All right, next one. I appreciate the banner mark. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just gonna leave that on. Um. Oh, we did that. <laughs> Thanks again. Adam. <laughs> I don't know how to click. Okay. Uh, Clyde Oasis for $5. Best used fun car for $10. All right, here we go. This $10,000. $10, $10, this is easy because every single video is now talking about it. The Honda Fit Sport with a manual transmission. Is it really under 10 grand? Yeah, you can get it for like you can get a 2010 2011 fit with a manual for like 10 grand or less. And you do what you have to do a $40,000 case swap to make it yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. No, they're really fun cars and they're super nimble and they're super practical and they that's just rot what, out at some They problem. just rot out, yeah. There you go. There Honda you go. fit. Uh, I'm just going to fly on the bandwagon. I bought uh DAC 101. Thank you for the $20 donation, sir. I bought a 981 Cayman S last year. Now I hate driving my Outback Dadmobile. Ideas for a replacement under $45,000. Man, you want to replace the Outback with something fun. Ugh, that one's hard. For four, under 45. Uh, Civic SI, that's a pretty... But the problem, the Outback is so big and so usable. Yeah, it is. That's a hard trade-off. You know Mike is doing that? He decided on SI. They were going to get an Outback. Yeah. Is this Sonata finally shit that did I tell you that? No, His yeah. engine let go, or like basically let go. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, I'm getting an Outback or Forester. And I'm like, and You got an SI instead. No, he wants an SI. He's like, I'm gonna, I, he's like, I can't do it. I physically can't do a commute in that. So now he, you know, trying to find an SI is gonna be a real challenge. But um, that's really hard because there's not a lot at that price tag other than like your commodity shit like uh rav fours and you're gonna yeah. die inside driving some of these yeah coming from the the porsche the 981 dude there's nothing like you have to get like an x3 and the wrx gti there you go the problem is it's small compared to yeah, the outback right you no, literally you have to go to an suv from that there's nothing else it's not under 45 or, grand and you can't get a used x3 i mean you could you, like, yeah, you can get a used X3 for under 45 grand. Or you get a used 3 Series wagon. I mean, if you want something that's more fun, you just ro ro roll in the dice with reliability. <sighs> yeah, tough one, 3 man. Series wagon. If you can find one... Oh, good luck. What are you, wagon man? <laughs> and yeah, next, gonna be, oh, you should get that it's gotta Audi be brown. It's got to be a diesel. <laughs> yeah, brown diesel. Um, DJ39 for $5. How long will they sell the Ice Porsche Macan alongside EV Macan coming out next year? Would you get if you, if you, what would you get if you had to choose? I'd get the ICE version immediately over the EV, unless you live within the... What a, what a horrible man you are. <laughs> you know, geez, you just can't get on with the future, can you? Um, I think they'll probably sell it alongside for a year or two, maybe three, max. 
they've already extended out the life of the Macan. They're not going to re-engineer that platform. So no. that's, that's going to be. I, I would honestly, I'd just go for the Macan and like see what they do because it's going to take them. I know they're. Their uh, EV platforms will be good, mm-hmm. but they're not going to have that shit figured out like first generation. Unless you're leasing, and then that yeah, changes. Yeah, the, you the lease that Macan, and then you flip it in three years for the next pile. Done. Next question, sir. What do you guys think about the fact that many YouTubers are getting the new Type R mark? You could just play the Curb Your Enthusiasm music over the over the the background of this. I don't give a shit what they get. You know, like, I don't know if they got it because they like it. I think they just got it to get it, some of them. Yeah, I mean, Topher is amazing. I know he's going to beat the shit out of that car. Mm-hmm. He and I got a GR86 at the same time, identical way through the region. Same with Everyday Driver. They got a GR86 at the same time we did, but a lot for the same reason. You guys asked for it. We did a series on it. Type R is for you. You're not doing a series on it. I don't. I really don't want to do a series on it. I, I mean, the only time I'm going to use that Type R is just to do, like when we do our GR Corolla comparison, so I don't have to beg for a press car or wait forever. We can have as much time as we want with it. Then it's going to sit. Like, that's a car for me personally. Like It means something to me personally, even though I don't think the car the, is the, like The GR86 is going to go away. I think we're going to get a GR Corolla. Yeah. Same thing. You guys have been asking for that car for a million years. And we're probably going to get it from SRP and everybody's going to be pissed off. But the purpose of it is clearly to, like in the sake of a comparison test, it would be great to have two cars that we owned where you're not having to beg manufacturers for stuff. And the new, uh, like a long-term ownership series on that. That's a car that, much like the 86, I'll pull the oil pan off. I'll work with Counter Space Garage. I'll figure out what problems there are. So hopefully you can use the series and my... Trials and tribulations as a buyer's guide. Uh, I'm not going to go through what Jack went through with the 86. I've already done that. Like, oh, yeah. like you pull that thing out of the fucking garage and the suspension is like, and the brake and pads are that's clunking. That's going to be the exact you know, same thing that's going to happen to the GR Corolla. For, yeah. for, and again, that's not necessarily for me, but just to do a series on so you guys can learn about the vehicle. All right, next question. Hopefully that makes sense I mean, to it's, you guys. it's not going to make sense. People are going to, uh, I might as well just sell the Type R now for over sticker. <laughs> yeah, that's what I should do is sell for like $40,000 profit and be like, hey man, look what I made. Can I use your GR Corolla long term review to justify my 30, 30K ADM? <laughs> if you pay $70,000 for a GR Corolla, don't, 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 don't do it. Don't, I will come to your house and admit you into the hospital. Uh, unless you buy mine. Then you, then oh, you should yeah, be buying yeah, yeah. my Jack, so then he can give me the money so I don't. <laughs> so I, oh, then you can pay me so I can listen to your Corvette stories oh, and perfect, be happy yeah. about it. <laughs> Mark, let me tell you about my Corvette. <sighs> It's got my, what do you say my interior looks like? Werther's Originals? Mm-hmm. I bought Jack. I won't talk while I'm eating because I'm having crackers. I'm feeling a little bit of indigestion from all this talking. About V8s? About V8s. Um, yeah, so we brought the, the vet to Chicago Auto Pros as soon as Jack drove it back from the factory. And, you know, there's anxiety about new cars. I'm not going to lie. Like, to me, 40000 is a lot. 30000 is a lot for a new car. But when you get to, like, whatever, six, uh, figures, uh, six yeah. figures for a car, the level of anxiety, just watching him drive this car, I'm like, dude, please, let's just get it back so there's not a chip or a, a, like, and a there is, windshield. there's already a chip on the rear wing just driving it back. Oh, whatever. So, yeah, when they pulled, when he pulled it into Chicago Auto Bros, they're like, oh, that looks like butterscotch, the interior, and then it, like, clicked. I'm like, Werther's original. <laughs> so I, it's sitting in the garage rotting, and I, I put a huge bag of Werther's in his driver's seat, and he finally drove it out for the first time. Oh, did you sit on the bag, hopefully? No, I didn't, sadly. Uh, no, or too, hopefully it gets really hot in there, and they just, just melt. melt. Um, oh, here, I want to answer this question. Sorry, just got here. Here for the worst phone award. Whatever phone Mark has okay. is the worst phone I've ever seen. All right, it doesn't do phone calls. All right, let's 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 do that first. We can take a break from the comments. Not that I really want to because we got a lot to get through. Um, where is it here? All right, so I pre-ordered this gem of engineering. A Sony Xperia 1.4, okay? Mark IV, technically that's what the 4 stands for because everything in uh, camera technology has to be Mark something, mm-hmm. like generational. So this thing I pre-ordered and I forgot I pre-ordered it. Why? Because it was supposed to be the cutting edge of camera technology for creators. It has the first and only optical zoom. So when you have the camera up, it will. It has a physical or a mechanical shift in the lens, so it can zoom in with the lens versus digital. All right, great. It shoots 4K. It shoots HDR. It does all these high-end things, and then you can see here. I'll try to hold it. 
each one of these here, there's four different camera apps. One's for video, Video Pro, one's Cinema Pro, one's Photo Pro, and then to record audio, there's another app for that. And each one of the interfaces doesn't do the same thing. So I bought it for a camera tool for the video stuff, and it's been very, very not good. It's not been good. So the best part about it, aside from that, is it's taken five software updates, five security patches, because it's an Android device. Every single one has subsequently made the phone almost unusable. The, the launcher that Sony puts on here freezes up constantly and crashes where you can't t so swipe anything. Literally, it freezes and I have to reboot it. The dialer is broken, and granted, the dialer is Android or a Google software. But I'll get a call. The phone will be ringing, and there's no way to answer it. It just rings, and I miss a call because the, the, the UI is frozen up. When I connect a Bluetooth in the car, I can only be on a call for 10 minutes before the Bluetooth crashes, and I can no longer take a call. And uh, what was the other stuff that I was complaining about? Oh, the battery life. It went from, like, 24 hours of battery life after the updates. Now I can only use it for barely 12 hours before my battery is depleted. And that's with like killing every single thing, keeping like I run it at 60 hertz, not 120. Worst phone, and take a guess how much this thing was. Oh, you told me earlier, it's over $1,500. Isn't yeah, it? it was like 1600 bucks for this. And I didn't pay that I because I'm an influencer. I paid like 1499 or something. Um, yeah, so this is the example why I bring this up because supposedly, a lot of the team from Sony Mobility that worked on this flagship masterpiece of engineering is working on the car with Honda, their new car, whatever they're rebranding it from Sony. And I can't wait to get into a car that is all software like that with the 60 sensors on the outside <laughs> and see how that software experience is on a car because their phone is so amazing. All right, anyway, let's, let's, let's get, get back, back to, to the, the questions. That's that rant over. Uh, Somewhere there, I think. We yeah, did we did one. that one. We did that. Yeah, we're Correct. gonna buy a lot of Arby's. Jack's not having that. Gentleman Goose 2.0 T-shirt restock one. The straight answer is: is it's so much money for me to buy the inventory? It costs me like ten thousand dollars a pop, and then it takes me like four months to get the money back. Mm. And I just don't want to be out like f like twenty, thirty thousand dollars of inventory. So if we ever get ahead financially, we'll do it again. Yeah, <laughs> if I if I get a surplus in the bank of like fifty grand, I will reorder the shirts. That that's where it's at. Yuri, uh, Yuri hello. from a straight pipe says hi, guys, with a heart emoji. That's very delightful. Thank you, Yuri. Savage Geese chat comment of the week wins a new ceramic matrix gray C8 Z06 with Z07 package carbon fiber wheels 3LT carbon arrow. This this guy was trying to get us to give away a car uh, by having us pick the top comment, and he won the top comment. However, he's not getting a car because I can't afford to buy one. <laughs> JDM flip flops. Do you have any more videos you finished shooting, uploading, then decided no, nope, I'm not posting it because you hated the car so much? Um, is that what happened with the RCF Track Edition? What happened with the RCF Track Edition is we never got that car, or the yeah, Fuji Edition. We, we had it in like an Instagram post or something in the background. What I was really taking a picture was the X7. I yeah. think I was either slumped over or you were slumped over the back because like you were done. I think it was you. You were totally done that day, and the RCF happened to be on the shot, but it was really more about Jax being done with me physically and mentally. Mark's in a good mood for the live stream. Is everything okay? Okay, let me tell you about this live stream. I was working on this yesterday. I was working on it the day before, and then today I was an hour ahead trying to make sure that it went smoothly. So, yes, I was very prepared, and that's typically how I want to be, and I'm happy that it's working. So that's why I'm in a good mood. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephen Thompson, thank you for the $5. Thoughts on the Buick Regal Tour X? Wanting something with good visibility without buying an SUV. So I have a friend of mine, I think his parent, I think his dad has a Buick Regal Tour X. He loves that thing. He says the gearbox tuning is trash because it's old GM, like 9-speed or 8-speed or 7-speed automatic. But says the car is great. It's, I don't know a whole lot about it. We never got one as a press car. Our relationship with GM has only dramatically improved in the last like... I think I only did one or two. Oh, no, we did a Buick. We did the Encore GX recently. <laughs> so just, just get that. Watch that video on the Encore GX if you really want to see a game changer. That's God's car right I'm going to ask this millennial here, this son of a bitch, 
You see this guy's uh, uh, avatar? Yeah, Schumacher. Do you see that barcode on the back? Mm-hmm. On the wing? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. You know what that barcode is? What? Is it his net worth? <laughs> yeah, it's his net, 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 net worth. So the barcode on the back is because they couldn't put Marlboro on their car anymore as a sponsor. So really? I did to, not know that. They had to black it out and put a barcode because there was something with, like, the I don't remember the tobacco thing. I hope I'm right about that because I look like such a dickhead. <laughs> this millennial doesn't know <laughs> shit, let me guy, tell him. And then I just made something up. All right. <laughs> So I want it to be his net worth. You could have just told me it was Schuma. It just you, you scan it from the or you scan it from the, uh, the cl- from the sky. Yeah, which, and it just I win. Yeah, Schumacher. How much do you think that guy was worth? I'm sure it's out there publicly. You know, uh, in his peak, hundred like, million, two hundred million, probably. Oh, probably more. Don't uh, you think he'd be closer to a billion? I have no idea. Is, what's isn't LeBron like a billionaire or a billionaire? Yeah, but I don't think F. I don't think F. One has the it has the global appeal now. Yeah, all right, fair point. I don't know. If you know Michael Schumacher's net worth at peak, at peak and then if the barcode thing I just said was right, post it up, and you'll win an award. His endless gratification. Yeah, like, yeah. I, yeah, I'm old and I know. Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm so old, I know that. Uh, uh, Genesis G80 rear-wheel drive versus all-wheel drive with rear steer. You pick. Oh, dude, you're Mr. Genesis. Genesis rear-wheel drive with rear steer. Can you get rear-wheel drive with rear steer? Or can, do, you, do you have to go all-wheel drive with rear steer? I don't know. <laughs> would you get an all-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive for oh, the Genesis? Oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, I would get a rear-wheel drive, even though I think the rear steer is great. I would get the rear-wheel drive. Because it's it's a rear-wheel drive platform, and I feel like the all-wheel drive really zaps a lot of like the dynamic part out of the car. And uh, I just checked the comment, and somebody said they Googled that. I don't know how to do that. Uh, yeah, Mark uses DuckDuckGo. I do use DuckDuckGo. <laughs> Um, and then somebody's like, hey man, did you read that article about DuckDuckGo yesterday? <laughs> they're, they're stealing your, your wife and your kids. Uh, somebody said 600 million, and then somebody said 700, and then somebody said 800. Uh, so, yeah. All right, go back to And then questions. somebody said something about the F1 car. The barcode would look like the Marlboro logo when driving really fast. Okay. That could have been Masa, too. Was it Masa? I didn't look at his helmet. Okay, well, anyway, sorry. <laughs> this is what happens when you answer too many questions. You're like, oh, is this anything's better than answering questions? I just want to ramble about nothing. All right, next one. Uh, what's your favorite seafood? Love you guys. Thanks, Luke. Mark really likes crab legs and spilling them in the back of an MDX and then making it smell like a dumpster. Yeah, there was a crab leg incident in the back of the MDX, and now it's hidden with rose oil, which t- smells like a funeral home. Defecation. Yeah, no, it does. It smells like a funeral home in there. I like. Uh, I do like king crab legs. I don't know why. There's no particular reason. It just goes down so smooth with the butter. I'm a sushi man, but Mark likes to believe my favorite fish in the world is swordfish. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've become more of a sushi man. I eat it. I eat it probably three times a week now. Tuna and salmon. There. Um, this is a true story. I can't remember. This was a couple years ago. Now, man, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I was visiting my my. I was visiting my parents. I was doing dinner to my parents, and my mother's a chef or a pseudo chef. And I'm like, oh, Mark, I gotta get. I gotta get home. I gotta go see them. They're making swordfish, and that's all Mark thinks about from now on. Yeah, because it was like it was normal to Jack. He's like, "Oh man, you know, I'm running late. My mom made swordfish. I got to get back." And I'm just like, "Dude, you didn't just, you didn't just say that." <laughs> her butler, her butler works so hard. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then I had to hear about Jack's one of the. You want to tell the story about one of the worst things? Like a lot of people have things from their childhood that happened to them, or like big things that redefine their life. Like mine was, you know, I'm not going to say it, but uh, for Jack. Oh, I told Mark about a childhood story about how my marble floors, the heating stopped, stopped working. <laughs> uh, and Jack was in the psychiatric ward for a month because he's dead. I can't, I can't get up and walk on this marble floor. It's, <laughs> it's so too cold. cold. <laughs> All right, next one. These are not real stories, by the way. Somebody's going to be like, or is it real? Oh. I'll leave it up to you to figure out. Uh, next question. Damn, figured the X7 would be a better dealer experience. Yo, Mike. Good luck finding a Civic. Mark, Mark now is owned by a Honda Civic dealership. Oh, so yeah. He can hook you up. Yeah, I'll, I'll call him. Like, you know, 
this was a big deal for me. I got a free... I did get Chipotle out of it. <laughs> I didn't disclose that. All right. Next. All right. So, yeah, the X7 dealership experience sucked. I thought the BMW dealership would be like, you know, they would kiss your... Not, I don't even want my ass I just wanted to be in and out. And it was one of the, the longest, longest experiences I've ever had. I think I was in there for like six hours and I was almost ready to walk out. It was so bad. Um, anyway. Uh, someone asked thoughts on the Mustang Mach 1. I asked all year last year for a Mach 1, and my payment was a GT500 instead. And that was a massive pain in the butt. They apparently just don't care about that car. Nah, why would they? The thing's like 7,000 years old, and how many How many do they sell? Oh. A thousand? Michael McDonald didn't tell me. <laughs> uh, how's the Type R, Mark? I drove it three times. <laughs> I drove it from the dealership to Chicago Auto Pros, and then Chicago Auto Pros back to the garage, and it sat for, to make my horrible video. And then I moved it in and out of the garage to another garage three times, ten feet. So I would say, from being on the street, it's a really good street car. And you drove in it a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's really really good as a street car. It blends everything. It's the co comfort mode. People are worried about it being stiff, and it is stiff in the upper settings. But comfort mode is like an SI. It's very good. The only thing that sucks about it is the engine. Not that it doesn't make power, it just doesn't have any personality. But yeah. that's all modern four yeah. cylinders. Zero, zero personality. It's a strong motor. It just, it, you know, it's not old. At least it makes stuff. power. Yeah, that's true. Uh, next question. The 86 is lame and I'm tired of pretending <laughs> it's not. All right, Liam. Liam Nissan. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. It's, uh, it is a lame car in that mm -hmm. it has a shitty four cylinder, but it's not in that it's a good car to drive for not a ton of money. And I don't, after doing this entire series, unless you live at the track or you go there often, if you just are somewhat of a track day enthusiast or you like autocrossing or you like twisty roads, a new car that you can get new car financing on if you're going to finance a vehicle or you get a long-term warranty on it, what else is there that's good to drive for thirty-one, thirty-three thousand dollars that also can be an only car? Yeah, good I, point. I, Borrowed an ND2 Miata Club while I was in Portland recently to visit some family. And I told you, that car, dynamically, as a street car, is way more entertaining to drive than the GR86 in every way. But you couldn't use that every single day. If you had, if you had a significant other, a dog, if you needed to do grocery shopping or move shit, the Miata doesn't allow you to do that. And the Mustang EcoBoost is not a driver's car at all. Hmm. The, yeah, the Miata is a toy, the weekend toy, yep. unless you live in great weather. The 86 can be used every day, and it is, I mean, honestly, every time I get in that car, I'm like, I, it's great, but, I mean, it is very underwhelming, and it has to do with the engine. I mean, it's not... It, we, unless we, you're on track, or you're driving flat yeah. out, or the car is sliding around, um, but, but that's the joy of it. It, it can't just be a regular right. car. It, uh, yeah, it's, it's such a mixed bag. Anyway, you're right. You're, you're definitely right, uh, Mr. Nissan. It's... It's not as great as it should it's be. It's not God's car, but... You know, it could be way better. We've always said yeah. it. It could be. But you can't have everything. I wish I had hair, and I don't. <laughs> I have Mo FL5. Grod me. I just saw FL5, dude. I just I was, like, transformed. Mograd me. Thank you for the $10 donation. I have FL5 three, number 360. It's my first manual. Is it normal that it feels like the shifter catches on something before it actually goes into gear? Any thoughts on upgrading into Integra Type S? Uh, so typically with Honda transmissions, and I haven't really felt it with the Type R, but I've driven a lot, Honda transmissions have always been really notchy until the gearbox heats up, um, and it should be really smooth after that. You might feel like a little bit of hesitation or just like resistance more when it's cold. That's normal. If you've been driving for 15 minutes and the gearbox is warm, you should feel no hesitation going into the gears. Also upgrading to the Integra Type S, oh. I, know, I know nothing about the car. I, I'm tired of speculating about it. I'll just see what it is. It'll have an LS7. It'll be rear-wheel yeah. drive. I Personally, you Jack said it. If the thing's over, like, 50 grand, you can count me out of that. It would have to be some, like, huge, great, amazing car. If it's a CTR that you can actually get that is minimal amount more money, like under $5,000 more money, and you can actually get it, fine. Yeah, I mean, it's the same car. Yeah. I, if, but see, this is Jack and I's debate about this. 
But knowing the Japanese now and how insular they are and how they wanted Type R back in their own factory, they wanted to design it, they wanted to make it, they wanted the Japanese name on it, they didn't want to have anybody else involved in it. It's purely them. For them to allow the American side to make a Type S, what's the chances they're going to be allowed to use the full-blown Type R engine? What's the chances they're going to have the same suspension as the Type R? Like all the things that make the Type R that, why would they water down the Type R brand for a Type S, which has always been under the Type R? I just don't see it. Well, when we do our video on it later this next year, or later this year, we'll find out. But I don't know, man. I wouldn't go into getting like getting in the headspace to get rid of your CTR, particularly if you like it, to get into Integra Type S. To me, the Integra Type S is a good option for people who couldn't get a Type R and didn't want to pay $20,000 right. for a sticker. I mean, the Type R is probably going to be worth a lot if they if they keep the volume where it's at and they can't make any more in that factory. That's just the reality of it. They have to churn out the commodity cars first and they have to fill the orders in Japan first, which is like 10,000 backlog. We were told they're backlog 10,000 units. So they're not prioritizing the American market first until the Japanese market's met. So that Type R will hold its value for at least a couple years and then if I really, if they make the Integra Type or Type S like a Type R, then it's a no-brainer. You buy that. In 10 to 1, it's probably going to have the 2 liter out of the Accord. Someone just said it in the comments. I agree with them. It'll probably have an option or as an automatic and be open diff. Or get a manual and have a LSD. That's probably how it's going to be. It's, but what yeah, do Yeah, whatever. Know? Yeah, we're just speculating. Why even... Uh, Dominic, oh, thank you for the $10, sir. Thank you, sir. I see that... that RS badge. I can't wait. Would you buy an EcoSport RS or a Ford Escape RS? Oh, damn straight I would. EcoSport RS? The TBD diff in the rear? I'm going to feel like a rally car driver. That's not funny. Uh, is this where I sign up for the Kiyosaka seminar? Yes, it is, Pablo. Just wait for another five hours and I'll come up. Next question. How is the total S550? Thank you, Badger, for the $2. All right, so I'll be honest. I thought that the 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 bidet, the Toto bidet seat, would have been in the in The, the junkyard. shop by now? Like, it would have been in the junkyard. But that thing has been punished since, when did I get it? Like, 2017? No, probably before that. I would say the first one I got is 2015, and it's still in daily use right now. Seven years later of daily use on a toilet seat that is mechanical with pump, sprayers, heaters. This, <clears throat> I'm getting so emotional. <laughs> <laughs> it's held up amazing. All right, next one. I just want to stop there, Jack. I want to close it out on the toilet. Yeah, we have uh, one third of our questions answered. Uh, Matthew Callaway, thank you for the $10. With your history with and perhaps affinity for computers and technology, what do you think car makers get wrong with a rush to cram tech into vehicles? Do they have fundamental misconceptions? This is going to be a long one. We talk about this all the time. I think... So it's probably not the biggest surprise. Mark and I both work in the tech industry in one capacity or another, and we still do with this job. Um, the thing that car companies are trying to become, and it's is tech companies, and tech companies are trying to become car companies at the same time. And with what Tesla proved is while you can get into the car space being a tech company, some of the fundamental issues with chassis development, QC in car factories, they can't get done particularly well. But from a car company perspective, in technology in vehicles is only just recently catching up to this. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. It's, it's, there are, I think the disposability of tech in general is going to be an issue once you cram it into cars. Uh, yeah. And the, it's the, it's exactly what you expect. The manufacturer's pure focus is not just tech. If it was just tech, it would be a different product. But it has to be car first, tech second, and now tech is becoming a, like, and that's one of the things in that, that FL5 video with the dealership. Like, we had a, like a two-hour conversation about how all their dealership stuff is all, like, complaints about infotainment and technology and lane keep assist and all the software part of these cars is what's... A, is all of the problem that customers have because they don't know how it, it's used. If they don't know how to use it right, it's not explained properly and every single manufacturer has a different way of doing it. And when you have no consolidation of tech, other than I guess Android Automotive is really truly the first uh, like common thread between these manufacturers and they can even fork it and reskin it the way that they want it. Um, 
until it really is consolidated down just to a couple companies where it needs to be, you're going to have a, a bunch of broken cars like long term. You're buying cars never getting updated. We know that for a fact it's never getting updated. Um, once they move on to the next generation stuff, unless you're like BMW, where you have like a multi generation of like a, a, a like a revision of it, like mm-hmm. iDrive seven and eight are still getting the same updates, but the previous generation is not really getting any updates. So they're going to update two generations at max, but most companies are not. Gonna I do don't that. know how car companies are going to expect and consumers are going to expect uh, phones to be like the cars to be like phones and not expect them to be disposable as phones are. And yeah. that has me deeply concerned personally, because a phone you can throw out in three years or right. four years and a car you can't, right? right? No one wants a four year old phone. And if cars become just rolling laptops, which eventually they're going to be, once the technology gets phased out or irrelevant, people are going to be stuck with sixty, seventy, hundred thousand dollars in a vehicle that is intrinsically worthless. Yeah, and it depends on how fast stuff accelerates too, right? I mean, like you could have a huge generational shift in technology that you know you didn't expect that came out and makes the previous generation completely irrelevant. I, I don't know. I think the cars are becoming too technology laden. Uh, the last story I'm going to tell is about the stupid range thing. Yeah. Um, I got an Electrolux dual fuel range, which means it has 240 power. So the range can be electric, convection, or gas. And I wanted electric, mostly for oven, and then gas burners. And they're typically more money because it's more expensive to do. So I got this range. The place that installed it pushed the range back. It screwed up the gas line, and the gas line went under the range and was touching the 240-volt circuit board and arc through was arcing through the gas line. It burned a hole through the back, and I flipped the breaker to see, and it turns out, like, if I would have flipped the breaker one more time, the thing would have blown up. So I had the guys come out, and they're like, oh, yeah, this is a disaster waiting to happen. You got lucky. But when I went to go back to replace the range and a whole bunch of other shit, I started looking at ranges because I wasn't really happy with the range to begin with. It was not easy to use. I found just like cars, the only way to sell newer versions of appliances is like you go to the store and they're all pretty, but they're all the same. Like even appliances, they have to have Wi-Fi now. It's like a standard feature so you can start your oven or like do the shit remotely. Like all of this stuff is built in there to the electronics part and to find a range that is literally like, I want to turn my oven oven physically with a temperature knob, the physical stuff, you get into boutique brands where like the Wolf oven, or something. like Wolf, Thermador, all these high-end brands that literally it probably costs them less other than the higher-end materials, like weight of them. Like to get a simple setup is now boutique. To get, to get like that in a lower price thing is impossible uh, in like a mainstream thing because y- the only way for companies to sell products now is to tack on all these features. That's why, like, one Hyundai and Kia do, right? Like, they are the masters of, well, you get everything for the lowest price. And for the most common person, the commodity person, that's what they want. That's what sells stuff. I think there's going to be a market for cars that come back down to earth, but it's going to take a long time. And it's going to have take a long time of people being fed up with, like, what the Honda dealer said. They're going to be fed up of bringing it back to the dealer, and the, the literally the dealership cannot fix it. They don't know how to fix it. Thus, the product is entirely disposable. Yes. Anyway, that's a long... Like you, you want that answer the question? Yeah, for ten dollars. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matthew. We love talking. Which about is that. better, the Toto by day or the new Type R? Uh, I'll probably have the Toto by day longer than the Type R. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. Thank you, John. Yes, I am looking at my phone to answer chat messages. I didn't have two screens set up because I didn't think we'd need it. Um, I regret that now heavily. I didn't think about this. I'll be honest. Uh, how can you get <laughs> how can you get a car for MSRP, a Civic, an actual thing we're saying in 2023? Yeah, I said this on Reddit. I thought it was funny. Like, if this was five years ago and I said I bought a Type R for MSRP, or a car for MSRP, people would be like, you're an idiot. You should have paid less than sticker. You know, you're how like, could anybody pay MSRP? You're getting ripped off. And now it's like a dirty word. All right, next question or statement. Two new Type R's listed on Auto Trader Canada. I checked for one is eighty one thousand dollars and one is eighty nine thousand dollars versus the fifty two thousand dollar Canadian MSRP. Healthy markup. Cool. I'll go buy it because that, that'll teach the dealerships a lesson to do it again and again. Uh, Nebo asked, "Hey guys, you've already done multiple Mark V Super videos. Will you revisit the manual one?" Thanks. 
Yeah, probably. I'm debating if it's going to be in a comparison test or by itself. It's going to have to be a comparison test. I don't want to do it standalone. It's just throwing a manual in the same car. I mean, we know what it's going to be like. I'm sure it's cool. I'm sure it's a lot of fun. But yeah, we got. I want to do it like against the Z or something like that. Or something relevant. Next question, sir. <clears throat> Nuck V, I apologize for buying a Honda Civic at MSRP, Mark. Next. <laughs> I should have paid like 50 bucks over just so I didn't say, oh, I paid over. Why don't you cover reliability anymore, i.e. Mark 8 GTI? The problem, Alan, with a lot of the products we've done videos on, and we talk about reliability and some of the legacy things that have been out for a long time, is when they're brand new, I can't talk to you about reliability because I have no idea. You know, if a car is brand, brand new, and there is a sample size of five, and one breaks... That still is an indication that the car is going to be a turd. Just meant one went bad. You, that's not how stats work. You need a large sample size to come to a conclusion. And if it's a brand new vehicle, particularly the Mark 8 GTI we got was basically a pre-production. No idea. I can't tell you if it's going to be reliable or not. You can look at the history of a car brand to tell yeah, you that. Yeah, that's the only way you can really know. But like modern BMWs are a good example of that. Like modern, brand new car-based products are as reliable as ba basically any of their other competitors does what does that mean it doesn't mean a lot like to jack's point it's I, I feel bad like you do new cars you don't know so you can only talk to what they're doing now and where are the risk factors i mean you can see some of the risk factors i mean certain brands they do not prioritize quality and they'll you know they only design that son of a bitch to work until that warranty date is and up once period. it's up it's your sol yeah, I mean, so I'm sorry. Maybe, you know, older cars, yes. We just did a Tacoma video. I, we kind of walked through what went wrong in them. Yeah, that that's easy, right? Because you know, and you can talk to it and be honest about it and, like, let people make their own decision. But, yeah, I mean, like, the Equinox is a good example. One of the reasons why we're not going to release a video is because the thing's dog shit, right? Like, everybody knows everything goes wrong with it after the warranty's up or before. And we already like, did an Equinox Yeah, video. so... Whether they reskin the new Equinox and it's totally different but still has the same engine and transmission, you can know probably categorically the thing's still going to be a turd. Maybe it has other things that are built better, but I, I don't know, man. Long-term reliability on a brand new product with no history is a hard thing to, to, to yeah. determine. Unless you know the inside, like unless you know the people that worked on the design team. When we did the the Ford Ranger yeah. The the Euro, like it was the old one that yeah, we yeah, got yeah. from Australia, right? Like after we did that video, I actually had people reach out to me that worked at Ford and like they told me what a turd it what was. What the people that worked on it, on the engineering team, that it was like all B team efforts and they just shit that thing out, period. Like that's a case where somebody like internally told me like how bad the thing is, don't buy it. But like most cars, you know, nobody's going to go against the company they work for that's making unless their career. Unless they're about to be done. Right. Yeah. yeah. Unless they're, they're out the door. Next question. I don't get the price is dictated by the market, and we won't sell to anyone other than local. That's hypocrisy. I mean, uh, I mean yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, the, even the local market for cars is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. If you're in any town with any sort of money, and it's a limited commodity product... Rich people are going to raise their hands and pay whatever they don't need to to get that car early. Didn't you say that that was happening with the GR Corolla? Oh, the GR Corolla. Somebody bought up all the... the uh... There are enough wealthy people in, for some of these cars out there that there was one dealer by us in, here in Chicago that every GR Corolla allocation was bought by the same person. They are like four allocations for the year and they're all purchased by the same guy. What, so he can flip it? No idea. I didn't ask that portion, but either give them to his friends or flip them. But just knowing that, and that's just local, that's here in Chicago. I mean, right. literally, there's a lot of people in Chicago, and there's a lot of money out here. But, I mean, uh, the dealers by me, too, uh, one of the dealers for the Z06, they were telling me that their first three allocations were purchased ahead of time by people who were willing to pay. They didn't ask for uh, an ADM, but they were like, here's 150 grand over sticker. I don't care what the car costs. I will give you one hundred fifty thousand dollars to be the first person for one of these cars. How do you compete with that as a regular person? You don't. I'm just being honest. I mean, long term, like any of these cars, these really rare cars, like the Z06, is not going to be a rare car. Just like the previous gen, they're going to build as many as they can. There's going to be like at least six or seven thousand of these things by the time they're done making it. People who paid one hundred fifty thousand dollars over for some generic car. 
you're going to feel like idiots. But if you have unlimited money, it doesn't matter to you. Right. And and so, but here, what about the, um, what about the the GR Corollas and the Type R's and all these other like affordable limited production cars? I don't know, man. I mean. The, the Type R is a good example. You're on a bunch of the Type R forms. A lot of the people buying these vehicles are self-aware. Yeah. But if, you know, you're someone who's older and, you know, you just want the car you want and money is just a number, you're going to bring up the the purchase price of those vehicles. If there's a limited number of cars, it's bullshit. And the dealers, you know, the dealers make it worse as well. But when you talk to some of the salesmen, certain dealers, like the one I was talking about locally, the salesmen don't see the ADM, the, uh, the GM does, the salesperson is basically getting screwed, making the same amount of money they normally would. Right. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know what you do with it. And I understand why people are mad, you know, honestly. Um, That's bullshit. But, I, you know, as a regular person, other than complaining about it, which clearly ADMs have existed. Like I, I watched an old Motor Week video with John Davis from the 80s recently. And even then they were talking about how unique low volume cars were getting ADMs, which is crazy to me. And this was a problem since the eighties. I'm gonna share this out for the non people that aren't into this. And I know this is a lot of type R stuff and I'm, I I apologize for this, but to, to, to make the point, it's not really about type R. Um, so when we started looking at, or when, when Jack's like, you should try to ask for an allocation, Honda's like, maybe. And then um, people are like, where's my car? Like, how do I get the car? And when we were at the press event, um, on the forums, there is, um, on the forums, there oh, is a website that this guy created on GitHub, and it's connected somehow to database inventories and shipping. So you can see here on this map where all the type R's are. And when you go to all color stats, you see right here that there's only been seven or 626 type R's available in the U.S., that have been shipped or that are being shipped. And it breaks down the colors. So one of the reasons why I wanted red besides my first Civic being red is it was the most rare color. And you'll see that the black and the red are the lowest volume because the other three colors are the premium colors they charge more money for. So they wanted to limit the output of the regular paint colors. And typically we don't get to see this data, but the fact that we only have 626, this probably includes press cars, media cars, and the media cars that have been sold to people like me or Topher or the, the, you know, the others. So you're probably looking at closer to 550 cars. So are there are 626 rich assholes out there that will pay over sticker to get their car. 100%. 100%. When you only have this amount of cars, you're, it doesn't matter if it's a Civic, uh, a Porsche, a Ferrari, somebody is going to look at those numbers and be like, this is an ultra rare car. I want it and I will pay more money for it. And gr I don't care if you, you know, if you're younger and you, you feel like this is like, or this car should be affordable. It's just not going to be. And that's just how it is until that number comes up, sadly. As I change a, a mic pack battery. Well, let's see if it connects. And we're good. All right. All right. So. Next question. Sorry about that. John. Uh, this was just unrelated. Uh, sorry. Keep going. Are car makers moving to selling subscriptions in order to increase profits? Your new car is the iPhone and extra services, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I think there's a good chance they move to subscription models. Uh, BMW is, they have trying, to. is trying in Korea. Th they have to. It's the only way they can afford the software development and all these teams to make these cars. To have, like, so Toyota Connected, they were up to like 1,100 people, right? And they started with like 200. So now they have 1,100 headcount. It's probably even more since we talked last. For them to support all these cars and all the updates, you need a team to do this. And the only way, because they're a cost center to have all those headcount, you need to have a way to generate ongoing revenue to justify their existence. And it goes back to what we talk about. Why do you need all this shit in these cars? It's like, literally, if we're still driving the cars, why do you need all this tech? And the thing is, this is how companies are, are selling the cars with more features and people become, they come to expect, well, does this car have Wi-Fi in it? Does this car have a hotspot? Does this car have Google Maps? Does it have always on connectivity? Does it update itself? And once you create that precedent, you can't get rid of it. 
And now you're, it's a double-edged sword. So now how do you pay the headcount to fix these cars and keep them updated? You got to have a software development team. You be basically become what Google and Microsoft and all these tech companies have become, and you're putting it in cars. So now you got to pay a subscription if you want it. Yeah. You, you know, it's just, it's just part of the deal. You want a basic car, you don't buy the shit, but nobody does that. I don't think heated seats and some of the core functions that you paid for to begin with are going to be subscription models. I don't think the market is going to accept it. But everything else, I guarantee you, if they can make it a subscription model, they're going to. I disagree with you. I think once all these cars become a complete modular like, uh, like slab, all that stuff is just going to be in there by default because they're not going to have a supply chain of like, oh, let's put heated seat coils in this seat but not in the other one. It'll be cheaper to, to amortize that cost of having the one of the same of everything and then just flipping services on and off. If we ever get the transportation pods where they're just little ba balls that roll down the road, I think that's true. But I think in the relevancy of what we're doing today, in the say five years, yeah. I don't think I don't think that's going to happen. I, no, I don't think it's I don't think it's immediate. I think it's a ten year thing. Maybe it, I think it's ten years. I think it's going to have to be. It's the only way these companies survive. Otherwise, they just it, it's going to be up to see if Zoomers and like the younger people accept it because millennials, you know, the next generations and boomers won't. I don't think they will. I, I think yeah, the Zoomers will be an interesting point because you know they literally are in a different mindset of money and phone and technology, and they're going to dictate the future of what goes in tech and cars. And I don't know. They, I think generationally, and you'll see this, when you're younger, you have more tolerance for this shit. But you reach an age of oversaturation, you realize this is not a good use of my time. I only have X amount of time, and I don't want to be, you know fiddling around with shit that does not work. I just need this to work so I can focus my energy on work, family, the things that I like to do, and I don't want to mess with everything else. So it'll be, I don't know, it's a really cool topic, and I think we'll see in like, Next we'll, question, we'll sir. know. Best used sports sedan. Well, one of those cars, only one of those cars has the B58 mark. You just answered, Jack, you never load this question up for Jack. He's always going to talk a B58. Must be all-wheel drive is the only requirement. B58 can be all-wheel drive, Mark. <laughs> Not the Stinger. The G70 is good for the price. You can find it pretty affordable. Um, the 340. Uh, the Type S is, it drives great, but the trans and the engine are horrible. For a sports sedan, I would take the BMW or the, the G70. All right, next question. Would you prefer your S2000 or an Alpha 5 if your use case was autocross or a track car? S2000. Agreed, S2000. Oh, shit. This guy doesn't know how to use his iPhone. I know it's pretty complicated. Very hard. Uh, sending love and sarcasm from Australia. Thank you, D. Kent, for your $8 uh, donation. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody. Is your channel, channel finally paying off? Uh, paying off and stress. No, honestly, I mean, every year we do this, we, we try to reflect twice a year. I mean, to be honest, we, we have our, our Come to Jesus business meetings, the risk of too much insider baseball. This year will be really telling for us. I mean, It's going to be a hard year. Yeah. We, we, like I set a two-year plan, and we're coming up on, in August around the two-year time yeah. frame, and that's when we'll, we'll decide if we keep doing this long term. Yeah. But my goal is big projects every month. Let's see if we can do some of these big projects that you get people excited about cars again. And you know, get, show passion of vehicles, and if you know the, if we can't accomplish it or we're unhappy, we'll stop doing it. But what know. to? Well, I guess the better question is: you have a captive audience of like people that want to be here and listen to us ramble for over two hours. You have uh, six million people watching right now because of me. <laughs> <laughs> what what is it that you want to see? What is the evolution and shift that you want to see from a content perspective? Because I'm going to do what I want to do, but at the end of the day, this is for the viewer base. And sometimes the viewer base doesn't know what they want, but I think there's you've got to tell us what's important. Jack wants to hit these projects, like these big videos that kill right me. Now. Jack only wants projects that are going to massacre me and look good on a resume, let's be honest. For me, I need a balance of like, I need to be creative, I need to be honest, I want to feel satisfied doing it. So knowing the business side, knowing the creative side, what is it that you want to see on the viewer side? Um, post that below, like, subscribe, and donate $50,000 now. <laughs> No, because I want I want to see it, and I'll go through that and like go through these questions before we. Finish. My dream this year, uh, we're doing uh, another Corvette project uh, from the trim level that's about to get released here shortly. We're doing a big comparison test. We're hopefully going to do things with Mustang. I'd like to do more big. 
Compero test where I get to meet and interview and show to the rest of the world that people actually get to work on these cars. You know, if if I have to fight as hard as I've been doing, or it's like uphill, and there's certain brands that are now amazing to work with. Yeah. GM is one of them, Porsche is one of them. But a lot of the other brands, it is like pulling teeth. Mazda's great in that regard. Yeah, Mazda's They have no good. money. Um, but I want to do more of those projects because I feel like that's what adds value. You're shaking the desk. I know. Dude. I, I'm making my business. You're pouting. Point. You need your my business. You <laughs> your business hammer. There's a great businessman story I'm going to tell before we answer the next question. A long time ago at General Motors, there used to be a man who walked around with a baseball bat in meetings, and on the bat it said "Beat Toyota," and he'd pound his desk uh, at business meetings with his baseball bat. That is. Some Do you remember eight- what car what cars he worked on at the time? I don't, and I don't want to throw the engineer who told me the story under the bus, but that is an amazing peak. 80s yeah. RoboCop OCP businessman. I'm going to walk around with my Toyota baseball bat and scream about Just scream at people? Why are we winning? Well, hopefully we revert back to that where you can pull that off and just be straight abusive and nobody's <laughs> going to care. Uh, Tom Montano, uh, the designer of the Mazda Miata, told me when he worked at GM in the 80s, they had all the designers in this like dark room, car designers, like artists, and they had a PA, and their boss would just scream at them over the PA while all the designers were in a room. That is that's horrible. <laughs> that's back when, when it was real. People cared about work. Fred the Fail Lord, has Benz reached out to you since you took a giant dump on the EQB? No. No, I don't think our Benz reps care. They just, you know, for them, it's about video content going out. You know, they don't really have a lot of resources from an engineering perspective. It goes back to the U.S. versus, like, German. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, a lot of these companies, they're just, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how, I don't, I don't get it. Whatever, it's not my business. Mark, you still own a Murano cab. I'm not going to comment on that right now. <laughs> uh, Chris Lamey, uh, what does you, uh, this is uh, for $10. Uh, thank you, uh, Christian. What does YouTube pay you guys for? Views, likes, subscribers, does that YouTube... A premium stuff affect you as well. You guys should take some extended time off. YouTube pays us for ve- uh, views and ad clicks. The way they promote your channels based upon likes and subscribers. So it's really goes down to views primarily and ad clicks. So the, there's a whole huge like algorithm how it works. Um, I would say just to keep it simple, the more views that your video has, the more friendly it is to advertisers. Advertisers bid on content. So if you're if, you, if YouTube sees your video, it goes out, people are clicking on it and viewing it and watching it for a longer period of time and then, of course, liking it and doing all the typical bullshit, they look at that as engagement. Like, oh, we're going to recommend this more. And then it gets recommended to more people. And then if those people come in and do the same shit, even if they're not subscribers, it recommends it even more until it grows and gets bigger. And that's when your ad rate tier can go up, the views go up, the more views, the more clicks. But if your video does not do well and YouTube recommends it and then people aren't clicking on it, ad rates go down, views go down. So you, it's impossible to know we know 100% what videos are not going to go out. Mm-hmm. Like it, I, if, like the, the Lexus one we just did, right, the GX. It's like a million years old. Nobody cares about that. If it gets recommended out, nobody's going to click it. There's no value to it being going viral or whatever you want to call it. Um, but we did that because our viewers, you guys, like Lexus products. I, I mean, it's just mm-hmm. you can't make videos for the sheer – well, people do – like the there's people that literally make videos for the only point, and we, we see this in the car stuff. And I'm not calling anybody out. I understand it, but the drag race stuff, right? Like literally, if you make a drag race video with the right cars, you're guaranteed a million views. And if you play on that, you can make a lot, a lot of money. The the thing is, is like that works now. So what's going to work next? And you really have to be on the business side of feeding that system. I don't do it because. That's not my interest per, per se. I think if I was really hurting for money, I'd be like, Jack, let's do some drag race videos. Yeah. We w- I know they would work. But again, it, it's a very weird system that rewards mostly views. That's, sorry, long, long ex- explanation. Let's start powering through these. We have a lot of questions, and we've been doing this for two and a half hours, and I promise we'd answer all of them. Next question, sir, here at the very bottom. Don't ever say that again. Zero G. I sh- you know, I should be seeing which one's light blue like that, Jack, but... Uh, Zero G and thank you for your twenty dollars supporting as always. I got a Veloster N last year because of your videos. I finished the CTS V big brake swap this month. Much needed improvement over the stock single pistons. Love you guys and always will support you till the end. Thank you, Zero G N. 
enjoy your Veloster uh, N. I didn't realize that CTSV big brake swap was something you do to a Veloster N. I mean, there's a surprising amount of cars that like Chevy stuff fits, but it makes sense. Like you're gonna spec your brakes from like an o- a supplier, yeah. and there's not gonna be a million different variations. So that's a car where it actually worked for. I forgot what other car did that. I ATS feel like, for BRZ. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, that's right. The, the original 86 was doing that shit. I wouldn't, I personally, I wouldn't do it, but that's just me. That probably makes more sense. Cause NSX or DeLorean from Mike G. NSX. NSX. I love the DeLorean, but no. Uh, ben, thank you for your $3 donation. That manufacturing video on Corvettes will be out at the end of the month. Yep, hopefully it's good. Oh, hopefully. Uh, Free Steve, thank you for the $10. Why can't companies make a car like the 05 Mustang um, with 15 and 23 Mustang styling with an interior that isn't test tech first and big horsepower numbers? Because that's not what people ask for. The, the cars cost so much money to develop. Programs cost so much money that for anything to get off the ground now, it is focus grouped to death. And the people they're asking, that is not a... Priority. People don't want old tech and cheap cars. They, what sells vehicles is marketing. Big screens, high horsepower. And that's the sad part about all this Free Steve and, or Free Steve. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've said a lot of this already in the video. I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna dig it in. The, the bottom line is I don't think people, the enthusiasts are the loudest voice. They don't buy cars in bulk. And to make a one-off sports car that's very basic and simple costs more money than a commodity car because they're not making their money back. The enthusiasts say they're going to buy it. They don't buy it, so they're stuck with 8,000 units. And when you go to the up top, people and say, hey, we sold 8,000 cars. They're like, big fucking deal. Bottom line, that that's how this works. And I, I hate to be that blunt, but it really is. Until sports cars, basic sports cars, you can prove that you can sell 100,000 of them, no manufacturer is going to do it again. That's just it. That, and that's what they tell us all the time. Like, they love cars too, just like us, a lot of them. But that's not the reality of the business we're in. It sucks. Uh DAC 101, it takes passion to people like you guys to make good videos. That brings up passion that people working... Man, my brain isn't working. That brings up a passion that people working at the manufacturers have. Thanks, Dak. I, I'm glad you, you enjoy that part of it. I think, again, people forget that these cars that owners and enthusiasts attach so much identity to, for better or for worse, are actually made by people who dedicate over probably half a decade in most cases of yeah. their lives to these projects and it was always my dream when I was younger to get to meet some of these people and now the fact that I get to interview them and show them off because cars aren't zero to 60 or mm-hmm. lap times they are passion projects at least enthusiast cars are often by really amazing people in many cases I like you know to, to that point like you have the fantasy of like meeting these people right for me I don't. Like, they're people to me. I don't make any of the car or the industry anything bigger than it is. For me, it's it's amazing to be able to get behind the scenes and learn to see these people's jobs and what all these people's jobs are without actually having to work for the company. So I don't want to work for these companies. I just want to see how shit works so I can share that experience that I always wanted to see on the back end, like watching videos or reading articles. Like, I wanted that access so I can share it back. That's what, that's what makes me excited. Um, and... You know, it's it's a lot more work than I thought it was going to be, though. To, to like to do that, to your point, like trying to get access to this stuff is like a full time job. It's crazy. Uh, Neo, for, Neo, thank you for the ten dollars. I bought a twenty twenty two TLX based upon your reviews. I hope you love your car, Neo. And yeah, the for, TLX is a really cool car. Yeah. I, 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 it's like it's this far away from like being great. Amazing, you yeah. know. Next question. Uh, cons two one three. Thank you, by the way. Um, do you guys have any insight how Alpha is doing? Will Solantis keep them long term? Bought a 2.0 rear wheel drive Julia and absolutely love it. I really hope that parts and service will be available. Man, that's a tough one. I just. Uh, Stellantis is going through such a transitionary period. And I'm now with the, the French part of them, I mean, they're probably going to have parts for them, but like most American manufacturers, Long-term part support is going to be a big question, and if the brand dies, you're probably screwed. I don't know if it's going to die or not, and that's that's the tough part. Like the Hornet or whatever the hell the new Dodge like SUV thing is, it's a rebadged uh, either French or Italian vehicle. I don't really care, so I, I can't remember. But the fact that that's not he, do, he doesn't not care that it's French or Italian. He just doesn't care like about what the platform. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
uh, you know, the fact that it's not a Fiat or uh, Alpha product, and there are no new Alpha products uh-huh. really, doesn't fill me with warm and fuzzies. That I, I, think it's, I think it's dead. I think it's dead in the U.S. Honestly, unless they do something magical here and make it the luxury brand of Stellantis in the U.S. But you don't have a dealer network. You don't have like really big marketing or any budget. I I think it's on life support personally. It's like I, it's wor- it, Alpha is worse than Jag in that regard. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, next question. Uh, Clara or Clar drives. Uh, what are your thoughts on using a car as a motivational goal at a young age? I'm 20, setting aside money to buy and maintain an E90 M3 as soon as I can. I love the amazing content, guys. Um, so I think like the the E90 M3. But uh, or, ignoring the car part, about thinking about cars as a motivational goal at a young age. Yes, it's a good motivator. It's a, one of the strongest motivators. I mean, things are motivators. I'm not saying that it should be. But I, I think, you know, when you're young and you have the time and you have to work for something, it's a really good outlet to, to drive yourself to push yourself a little bit more. Like the, this concept of like all the silent quit or quiet quitting and all the people that don't want to put the hours in at work, I get it because you're working for another company that's reaping the benefits for your slave labor. But on the counterpoint, it is selfish as well. If you get in with a decent company or making money, you can make a lot more money putting in that extra hours, that extra time. There's a lot to learn in a job, whether it's corporate, it's bullshit or not, you can learn a lot. And it's how you take away that experience that drives you for the future. So if that like in your head, like I can afford an M3 if I work an extra 10 hours this week, you know, you can flip that around and be like, how can I help my team or my boss tackle like projects that nobody else wants to do because at, at the end of the day that will give you a lot of like for for most people it gives you a lot of credibility it gives you you become a go-to person you know do you think cars are good motivation motivational goals i'm like i'm mixed on it personally i think you know things are things at the end of the day and i i don't know i there's a part of like being young and being irresponsible that i you don't you don't want to be this person and buy an M3 after you've set aside forty thousand mm-hmm. dollars or thirty thousand dollars and then go bankrupt immediately right, when the car right. breaks. I'm not saying, that, I guess to rephrase it, I'm not saying that the car is the reason you work hard, but it's a tool to teach you some work ethic that might get you over the hump of like ah, I don't feel like working. Fuck this place. But if you have a more personal goal of like, hey, it's a means to an end, and I can get something out of putting that extra work in to get the money, there's very few things that cost enough money where you have to put that extra work in. Mm, like from houses, well. cars, cars is a big thing. And like young people with cars, like enthusiast cars, it's that's why it's always a meme or a joke. It's like, hey, do you want to keep your kid away from doing drugs or like getting 20 women pregnant? You know, give them an enthusiast car and have them go broke and modifying that. I'm not saying do that, but you know, there, there's benefits from it for sure. Next question, sir. Sorry. No, no I worries. No, it's a, that was actually a really good question. Uh, yeah, Mike, it, uh, to answer your question again, yeah, the Nissan people, as much as I give Nissan a hard time for making a lot of crap for a long time, and as much as you people can make fun of the new Z, they are a really passionate bunch. I just, I wish that brand had more money. For them internally, the Z, the Z is a good car for what it is, and you just have to be in that mindset. Right. Is it as good as a Supra? I, I think it goes down to all these companies. They do have some passionate people in there, but most of the time they're stuck on chicken shit projects that they don't want to do. I mean, I brought that up in the Z06 thing. Like, sometimes you have to work your entire life to eat shit. And that goes back to that M3 question. You have to work hard for a long time to get that dream project or to get that dream car that you want to buy. Things don't just drop in your lap all the time. So, And that's the passion uh, that showed. Th- that's the passion. These guys literally had to do a lot of shit for a long time. So when the Z came around, they're like, thank God I get to work on this. I'm going to put everything I have because this is the one chance and I get to do it. Too bad they had $10 to do it. Well, I mean, but they made the best of they it, could, right? Yes. That, that's the point of like all these cars. We want everything for nothing. We want the best stuff. But the reality is, is a lot of the people behind them, they don't have unlimited budgets. And it's a miracle these things get made. And yes, the Z has problems. Like, we, I, I mean, even going back, you know, how can you build a car that has fuel starvation at half a tank. I mean, like, these are basic things that should not be happening. But again, there's reasons behind them that a lot of companies will not talk about because it's inside baseball or somebody didn't want that, but there was no money to do it or somebody got overruled. Every car has these things, and it's just the human part Part of business. Yeah. Next question, sir. Or statement in that case. 
Bob Vandell II. You guys can keep up with the humor and production quality and review fewer boring cars, like the crossovers and shit. I wish we didn't have to review crossovers, but I can tell you, for example, this month alone, he doesn't do all the traveling that I do. I have to go do a pilot review because, sadly, that's an important car to people. Not sadly, but that's an important car to people. And, you know, that's why we do it. A lot of the crossovers are what actually sells, and that's what people ask for. For as much enthusiast car videos we do, sadly or, or not, there are many counterpoints of why can't, we, can't, can't you do more affordable or regular people cars. I think the the good one is like look at Haggerty and you know now that we've met Jason Camisa and talked to him quite a bit, we're not in the same like headspace, um, we're not like the same type, but we have similar like ideas of like we want to make certain quality content. Well, Jason doesn't shoot his videos, he doesn't edit them, so when he goes to make like one of these drag race videos or one of the comparison videos, it's like running out of track, it's big money, it's a lot of time, and then it takes them over a month to edit these videos. Now think about that. Like if all your your income is just coming from releasing videos, like our our most of our content is ad revenue supported, right? You don't make money by releasing one enthusiast video a month. I mean, that's one of the reasons why. The other reason why is I don't wanna do just car enthusiast videos. I don't wanna become a car enthusiast only outlet because that really puts you in the corner of and that was one of the big problems why i didn't get press cars to begin with yeah, is like we did enthusiast cars nissan was one um our rep yeah she's like oh i i didn't want to give you guys regular cars because i thought all you did was enthusiast vehicles and honestly like i was joking around about the numbers look at the rav4 look at the f-150 look at all these commodity vehicles those are the real cars that people buy and those are the people you also need for me i want to learn about those cars and help people like our family members yeah. You can help. You can truly help people that are looking to try to make a good decision. And if we can help to teach, or at least to show it and let people make a better decision, that's why it's important for me to do some of these shitbox cars, or some of the more boring cars, or some of the great commodity cars. Like things that I never thought would have been good. I've, I've, some of my favorite cars are just normal vehicles, not the fun stuff. Next question. Sorry, that, I mean, no. I'm just trying to explain. Thanks. Uh... Capoeira, thank you for the $10. Thanks for the videos. Your adv advocacy led me to buy an LC500 of my own. Makes sitting in traffic uh, much better. Have either of you driven the hybrid? Love to know how it compares. Don't drive the hybrid. It looks cool if you like the LC styling. It has the same interior. But the V8 is what makes the LC500, in my opinion. As soon as I drove the hybrid, I was so disappointed. You drove it on the track too, didn't you? No, I didn't. I, maybe I did. Yeah, remember at the Toyota event, you drove it on track, which is hilarious. Oh yeah, I don't. I don't remember. That's how little I remember it. I, I mean, I just that was my overall feeling after coming out of the V8 and driving the hybrid. I was just purely disappointed. It felt like a shell of a car, and that's how much the drivetrain makes a difference. I'm glad you liked the LC. Still one of the coolest cars on the planet. Next question, Ben. Thank you for the $7 Canadian, or um, thanks for existing. I really enjoy the content you guys make. What's your first impressions of the new Toyota Prius? I will tell you Mark's first impressions because I was there when it happened. So a year before the Prius press event, Toyota does this every year at their annual come to our headquarters thing. They show you some unveiled products or like upcoming products that are complete. Like they did it for the Tundra the year prior to this. And they take away your phone and they tell you, you can't say shit about the product. Um, and they pull off the, like this basically like blanket or tarp over this car and you're supposed to go, wow. Uh, Mark has infinite wisdom and I've told this story before, was standing right next to me and behind us were all the senior leaders of Toyota and Mark didn't know they were there. And this blue... Uh, like it was like the dark blue, blue Prius like, like base model thing. And we were on the side, we were yeah. on the side of it. And uh, Mark's first words as he, in between his laughter was, that looks like a fucking Dodge Dart. <laughs> and uh, the Toyota personnel apparently had a meeting about that later. It was like, oh, does this look like a Dodge Dart? It's a great looking car though. Uh, the, the, at, least the stuff, at least the stuff that they've released now, as I'm spitting everywhere, yeah. as I'm so excited for the Prius, the, the ones that we saw at the auto show, like the upper end ones, the prime, like the dark color ones that didn't look like an old man spec. They, it looks a lot different from different angles, but that like the base model ones, which is what you're going to see on the road, to me is, I don't know. I, I hope it's enough. People seem excited for it. And 
Personally, I'm excited because it's a car, a hatch, a car that's not a CUV or SUV, so I hope it, just from that perspective, sells really well for them. I think it looks better than the new Corolla does. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's a good looking little like regular car. Yeah, and I mean, I, that, I was telling that to somebody today about the, oh yeah, it was about the RAV4, like, you know, everybody's gonna go to a RAV4 for the price, right? Because it has bigger, it's bigger, it has more space, all that shit. But that's just because we don't have good car options anymore. You know, like cars are just, no, they're not putting money into them, they're putting an SUV, so it's nice to see they put some money into the Prius styling, I, I, as much as I think it does look like a dart from the side. Had an 05 Corolla XRS before I got rear-ended. I got an 07 SI as a replacement. Should I look for another 2ZZ XRS, or should I just be happy with the experience I had? I, I mean, I personally wouldn't. I, I would just stick with the SI. The, the XRS was cool, but it's going to be so hard to find one of those. And I mean, not that a, finding an SI isn't hard now. I think the SI is a better car, other than... If you're going to go back to the experience, I mean, uh, this is a huge, like, have, you know, set aside a, a small fortune, but... Uh, like a, a base of lease, doesn't it have that motor? Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's the XRS, and then I forgot what the, to look it up. Um, what what motor did the Elise have? I can't remember, because it's a Toyota high revving engine. Yeah, it was the, I think it was the same one. I, I can never remember the engine. If you want to experience it. the engine again, do it in a dedicated sports car platform. Yeah, I, I think at this point, just, you know, try to, um, or, Try to try to move on to something else. If it got totaled out, and this is what happens to me, like I had the warm and fuzzies and went and, and, and tried to get the same thing, and um, it was never the same the yeah. second time around. Nostalgia's yeah. a bitch. It's the 1.8 liter, so yeah, it's, I think it's the same thing they put in the Elise. I can't tell off the picture. Let me see if I can find a picture. Of course, this is all fucking zoomed up. Anyway, yeah. Um, just stick with the SI. You can build the SI out. To be hilarious. Yeah, just put an intake on it. That's all you need. A uh, seven inch intake. Next question. Been eyeing a Julia. Wow, a lot of questions of the Julia. Because it's it's the cheap car right now. Hexaform for $5. Been eyeing a Julia versus a TLS for a while. What's more fun? And what's your speculation regarding the current Italian makes? Uh, Alpha, I think, is a dead brand uh, unless they rejuvenate it. Uh, Ferrari and Maserati are their own thing altogether. Ferrari's going to be around until the end of time. Uh, Maserati, we're trying to do an MC20 video in the spring. We'll see if that actually happens. Um, You're looking at a very difficult choice because the Julia is a rear-wheel drive architecture. It's really good. The interior is pretty good. The styling is unique. You're just you're saddled with the engine and the drivetrain. You know, not that the TLX Type S is is like amazing, amazing but it's still it's better in its turbocharged form. And um, I think the chassis of the TLX is good too. And the all wheel double drive system, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is really good. I, personally, if the price was the same, I'd choose the TLX. And that's not just, I, I really think it's a better car in that regard. Um, the Julia is only to me like Quantifolio. really, really great. Yeah, that's where you really see what that car is. And anything less is really hard to take. All right, next question Jonathan for $5. Favorite daily for $65,000, considering a Civic Si, Integra, last gen M2, Macan, open to others except for Hyundai for $65,000. That's a lot of money. Uh, you have a lot to work with, but if you want a daily M3. An M3, yeah. Last... I saw a G80 today. The, the G80. F80. F8, 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 yeah. F80, sorry. The F80 today, a four door on the road. And I'm like, God, that car looks great. Yeah, I saw like even the, the four door, I'm like, God, it looks so good. I like, it's just, I at first, I, I mean, I always liked it, but it's aged so well, and I think it's because everything's got more ugly. You're like, man, that's a classic looking BMW. If I if I didn't have that GR Corolla coming, in, you know, that would be to me an F. Assuming it doesn't like become worthless if you put mm -hmm. like three thousand miles on it, I think the F80 is a good looking car. Yeah, that's what I would get, and it's fun to drive. Yeah. Like, I think some of the problems with the, the chassis of it going sideways everywhere and having too much torque, initially, if you looked at it from a driver's perspective, was yeah. a problem, but now it's character. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the SI and the Integra, they're, you know, they're, they're shitbox, like, eco cars. You know, they're fun, but, you know, if you have a $65,000 budget, I mean, yeah, like, if you, get a, if you get in an M2 and you drive an SI and Integra, you'll be like, 
Oh. <laughs> yeah, like what what just happened, you know? Um, all right, next question. I always tune in for the timeless production pieces, the pilot gear. Blame you guys for igniting my Miata, my Miata passion. Looking forward to something profound regarding to the new CX-70 and C- CX-90. That's going to be up to Mazda. I've pitched them on the project. If they have the resources and the time, we're going to do a pretty big film on their rear-wheel drive platform, but the ball's in their court. Ah, uh, yeah. that's It's in the works. Yeah. Uh, R London for $20. I have a Ghibli SQ4 with 52,000 miles. It's been super reliable. You're the only person I've ever met ever that said their, their, their Ghibli has been super reliable. Congratulations. I have a one. I have a year and a half of warranty left. Should I chance keeping it once the warranty is up, or should I dump it? Well, based on what you just said, and uh... you are a god. You are the luckiest human being I've ever met. I sold when I sold cars in college an SQ5 Ghibli. I think I sold it. I think the car was like, like a fifty dollars. <laughs> it was like a year or two old, and I think it was less than half of its MSRP. Um, oh, yeah, that's that's rough. I mean, I would sell it, dude, honestly. Nobody's ever, like, oh, an oh, oh, high-mileage Maserati is, doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> I mean, I, it's just, London, I'm really sorry to be the one I mean, to bring I, that up. It's like an old Jag, right? Like, it's it's got the same thing. I just think the old Jag is cooler than the old Maserati. Well, that's because you're a British snob, dude. First time seeing you guys live, that's great. And, uh, great and more talk in car audio quality. Yeah, uh, that's... It, yeah, it's we need to figure out how to make it. The problem is nobody cares about it, but people care about it. So it's like you go to one extreme and do more on it, and people like tune out because they don't know what the hell you're talking about. We need to do a better job making certain things more accessible, and uh, we'll put that on the list of things to do, including our Discord. <laughs> yeah, they will we'll, we'll go up. It is dumb though. It is actually done. Chin face, assuming he's not dead in a ditch somewhere, put a lot of effort into putting that together. So one of these days, Mark will finally connect our YouTube and our Patreon to it, and it will go live. I don't know when, but it will happen. Anish, can you explain why you made a video about your Honda experience? It felt like an ad, not your typical programming. It was a very weird video, in my honest opinion. He's talked about that enough at this point. Let's move on to the next question. Go back and watch the beginning, the first 20 minutes of the video. I explain it in great detail. Do you have any opinions on your GR86 BRZ Twins? Have, has your experience or opinion changed on the 86 BRZ Twins over time with ownership? What would you replace it with if you could? All right. I guess this is a question for me. Um, my favorite time to drive the GR86 as someone who loves going sideways is in the snow and in the wet. And I will tell you, in the snow with snow tires, if you are okay with a thing getting loose, you can drive that thing around like you were in a, a formula drift race. It is unbelievably com- like comical. It's one of my favorite driving experiences. Everywhere else, if you're just driving like a sane person, the drivetrain is so boring. So boring, it sucks the soul out of that car. And not that it's slow, because it's not really anymore. It's just the drivetrain sucks. On track, at the limit, particularly with the way it's modified now, it's good to drive. I mean, it's almost as fast as a Supra on RE71 RSs. Yeah, it's and crazy. It kills the Nissan Z on RE71 RSs around Audubon South. I'm sure the way it sits now is faster than your Type R. Don't ever say that. <laughs> I was paid to say the Type by R is the Chipotle, best car. Uh, yeah, uh, by, by a Chipotle a burrito. Uh, burrito bowl that that car is superior to anything you could come up with. Um, but I bought the GR86 to do a series on for, for the channel. Because, again, I know so many of you were excited about that car. That's why we bought it. We're doing it again for the GR Corolla. That's a car I'm very interested in. Not because just because you guys love it. But Mark and I were both dramatically disappointed by it at the press event. It was a car that I was super excited for when we were there. And, like, all the ads and talking to people. But when I actually drove it, compared to the Yaris, it felt neutered. But it was in a limited experience on a track we weren't familiar with, with a really weird configuration. I was so disappointed that I know I'm going to be happy to drive it on the street and like in real world conditions because it just, like, again, it goes back to the marketing, right? You see the, the Larry Chen stuff and all the marketing that they've done for Corolla, and all it is is that car going sideways. You can't get that car sideways. Uh, like, you'd have to put trays on the back of those tires to get that car to drift and do all that stuff. Talking on the to, street. Talking to someone who worked on those ads that is not Larry Chen, the marketing guy, the way they got it to go sideways is they basically soaped down the rear tires or they in, overinflated the tires to the max and used all e-brake. 
It's not a car that you are thinking of. Like when I thought about it going sideways for some whatever reason, I was picturing the G R eighty six. That doesn't do that. Which isn't the only reason I like cars. Yes, when cars go sideways, like the EV6 GT, I have an infinitely better time than when they don't. Yeah. But that's not really the whole point no, of that No, that car. car understeered everywhere. 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 It was, at least on the track that we were at, it was not a car. At the that altitude was, we were at. Yeah, too. and it was not something, and it felt like there was a lot of heat soak in it. The more you drove it, the less power it made. And out of a three-cylinder... I don't know. Again, it's one of those... We, I talked about this at the beginning. They put you on these press events. They blow your mind with the hype. You drive it, and if you walk away disappointed, there's a problem. The Type and, R was not that experience. The Type R the, was the, not that way. The GR Corolla was. So I think from a series perspective, seeing what goes wrong with the car first will be yeah. great. Working with, again, Mike and David at Counter Space Garage will be great. Yeah. Olean's has stepped up. They want to do a damper kit with us on that car okay. to address some of the suspension problems with the vehicle. Yeah, uh, I'm excited for that. But I'm excited for it from a video perspective. I want to have learning. both the cars that we own, both the Type R and the GR Corolla, where we do our own shit on track and we do our own thing to it. Because it's it's it th- those are two special cars that are unobtainium for no good reason really. But it'll be fun to to go through that in the ownership experience of both of them and what they do great for their respective price points. Honestly. All right. Next question. Uh, Thoughts on the Super Cross Trek six speed man? Do it. It's the only thing of its kind, and it's super, super great as a as a practical, usable car without getting a real SUV or the Civic, which is way more money. Yes, um, sounds like you guys have had several sets of Olean's dampers between the eighty six and the S two K. Would you recommend them for non track you? Yes, they are great dampers. There's one caveat to them: you absolutely one hundred percent have to have the Olean's top hats. Do not go to some aftermarket crap if you can get the Olean's top hats. You know, the, to put the shock in the the upper hat by the the shock or strut tower, it makes a huge difference. They never make noise. Unless you have a, a double wishbone car where you don't need that, you still need it. You need the camera plates for the SC thousand. No, it's got top hat. It's oh. still got a top plate. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Not using reusing the factory ones or an aftermarket one. The ones that Olean's made, I w- I would not buy those without it. Uh, they ride amazing on the street. I mean, there's it's, so many people that know the settings for them and all that stuff too for each car. They genuinely, in the 86 this case, it rides better than it did stock in all conditions. Yeah, the S2000, although I did Swift Springs instead of the stock ones, the car is just so much better in every condition. I wouldn't trade it out, but I don't put a lot of miles on the car. If I was putting on 25,000 miles or 12 to, I'm sorry, 15 to 20,000 miles a year, I would not do that. I would just stick with the stock suspension because you, you have to or rebuild Or do a Coney or a Bill Steam or something. Right, yeah. Uh, which modern car is the worst sound We've system? Answered we already. answered that one. The Nissan, or not, the Nissan Ridgeline. I remember your earlier YouTuber where you paid tribute to your late mentor and talked about pivoting into creating car enthusiast content. Wish your critics could see your origin story. It, it's perspective, right? Like the thing is, is in a moment of time, this was my failing. Is I made assumptions in that video. This is going back to the the start of this video. I made assumptions that people knew what I was talking about. If you do that, then like people don't have perspective of who you are, where you're coming from, and I'm not taking in perspective of other opinions. So you have to, like this is the weird thing about doing videos, you have to, to, to try to speak out to, to make it accessible to more people. So if we get into a car and call it a pile and say these things are garbage, the enthusiasts might know why it's garbage, but the people that are tuning in, like these guys are jerks, they don't know what they're talking about, the instant reaction is anger. Um, and yes, if everybody knew you, they would know that you're not a bad guy. You're not a bad guy, but you know, like they don't know you and I that that's my failing and it's a good lesson for people too is like you need to always be aware that people don't always know where you're coming from and you need to take that extra time to try to be to try to understand different points of view and try, and just make a bigger bigger effort to be a good person. Okay, I'm a Next horrible question. person. Thank you. Uh, what was the Kirk, Kirkland signature for automobiles? Asking for a friend. Pags 222. Thank you very much. CRV, Rav 4. Yeah, pretty much. I have a Mira four cylinder yeah, on location. allocation. You've brushed on modern Lotus being hard to deal with on your end. Am I making a mistake? I don't want to trash them, but if you have an allocation, Go hopefully for- it's in a year. Like, hopefully the first model year is done. That's all I'll say. I'm I'm really excited for that car in many ways. But dealing with them on the corporate side is very disheartening. And I think de- knowing what they're like to their dealers, I, I know dealers are the bad guy, but we knew we the, the dealer we worked with to get our original Vora, 
hearing what they had to deal with from a Lotus side, even and this was after they got bought out by Geely. I'm like, man, I wouldn't want to be a Lotus dealer. As an owner of an old car, I would say don't buy it. Now, things have changed, but they've gotten better and worse in some ways. And I know, I can pretty much guarantee you that if we had an Avora and a, or an Amira and an Avora GT back to back, the old car would be better. Not better built, not better interior, but better to drive at the limit. And that's all I'll say about it. I would say wait, if you're dead set on it, wait it out. Please just wait it out until they can get production up. And there's more people with these cars and more people that actually have driven them for real and not just like hand-picked certain people to drive them in order just to get the production up. The, the Amira four-cylinder as well. I think the biggest thing about that car is getting it as a manual and you can't get it with a four-bobber. So. Yeah. Uh, A6 All-Road. E450 All-Terrain or A6 All-Road. Tyler, thanks for the $5. All-Road every single day. Yeah, it's a great car. I bought my 13 BRZ with 269,000 miles original drive here from an old doctor for under 5K. He only used regular gas. Any harm switching to premium. Switch to premium right away. The engine tuning was set up for that. Um, not to say that the engine would have a problem. Particularly after 269,000 miles. Yeah, I mean, he probably drove it like a grandma, but yeah, the, you'll get a lot better performance out of premium. Um, and then you'll also want to do like fuel, like a fuel injection flush, or just use like Tecron for like five fill-ups just to flush any deposits out. Um, because it's dual injection, you're going to have a lot less worry, but I would switch... 100% switch to premium, run two tanks through, and then disconnect the battery cable, like the negative battery cable. Let it sit for like two minutes, plug it back in, and then immediately start it and drive it like normal around for like 100 miles because it'll relim- relearn the fuel trims on that car. So your fuel trims will correct, and then the ECU will recalibrate its knock sensor to the different octane fuel that you're running, and you'll get better performance out of it. Um, I'm going to answer a question from Super Chat that... Okay. Um, Spiffy Acorn asks, thoughts on the future of Jaguar as a brand um, and their relationship with Land Rover? I'm a big Jag guy. I have just because they're sort of the the underdog. But I can tell you from talking to the reps, formerly who work there and currently who work there, they're they're SOL. I mean, I I don't know how they survive. Personally, like Jaguar is talking about going super high end. I don't know how they do that. The only thing that keeps that brand alive from an automotive perspective is the F-Pace, and what really keeps that brand alive is Range Rover. Mm. Like, Range Rover, Land Rover sell fairly well for their segment, but the people who ran Jaguar squandered such a massive opportunity from five, six, seven years ago when the XC and XF were first re-released. They were yeah. actually good cars. When the F-Pace actually came out, and they just didn't do shit with them. Right, yeah. They don't have a lot of money. It's, again, you're trying to do a lot with a little and compete in a luxury space where you have these giants mm-hmm. um, that have a lot more resources, and they're, they're, that's just how it's always been. They've had to pull budget and pull resources from everything, and, you know, it's there's a lot of competition. It got so bad for Jaguar, from what I've been told, that they literally had to sell press cars to just keep operations going. That's crazy. From, a, like, a PR perspective. <sighs> Next question. Chris walks fast for $5. And again, thank you to everybody who's donated to ask a question. I've also mixed in non-paid questions in here this time because it's easier. How do the Integra Type R S2000 NSX compare in terms of gearbox, driving fun, and something you'd want to purchase or keep? Uh, I would put it in this order, honestly. Um, Stock. Stock. Stock cars. I would say NSX, S2000, and Type R. And I only say that because the Type R is, you know for what it's going for, is not worth more than an S2000. There's not no planet that the Type R is better than an S2000 stock for, like, spending $40,000, $50,000. Um, and it makes sense. That was the price point. The NSX was, like, the, the you know, pinnacle halo car. S2000 was, like, their, one of their only rear-wheel drive cars, and the Type R was front-wheel drive. The first-gen NSX, the ones pre-power steering. It's 94 and below. 94 and below. Um... You drive the car on the street, you're hyper underwhelmed. And we got, for this video that we're doing, we got a museum car shipped over to us and we drove it on the street. And I'm like, why? When you drove it on the track, within one lap, once you load up that car, you're like, this thing is amazing. And Yeah, we, we said this, and I, we're probably not going to say it in the video, but it's one of the only cars where you can't believe how much of a difference in personality it had. Like, from what it drives like on the street, you're like, this is going to be horrible on track. 
but again, this is 94 and below. When it had newer tires on it, to be honest, it was like, I think the Dunlop Durezza's on it, something more sticky. So when you got on the track, it's because there's there was manual power steering, and or manual steering, I'm sorry, manual steering rack in the 94 and below, and it like it was a workout in your arms to steer this thing. You felt everything through it, and the engine was just, is just powerful enough for the car. It was so much fun to drive, um, and it is a special car, even with its era removed. It's definitely not fast, but it, you feel something. That's what all these cars here, the S2000 has the least amount of feel, in my opinion, but it's the best dynamically, how it moves with you and moves around corners, but special cars for their era. Uh, when will you review the 2023 BMW 7 Series? Is it better overall than an A8? Uh, I have no idea yeah. when we're going to get... Uh, BMW is an interesting brand. They will work with us. They will answer some of our technical questions. But when it comes to giving us vehicles we ask for, they're terrible at it. But giving us random cars like a BMW X1 or a refreshed X7, they will. They're I, get, we're going to get whatever's in their fleet. That's it. If there's anything outside that's not in our fleet, we're not getting it. And if we have anything outside of normal questions, we're not getting answers on BMW. So for Jack and I, we both have BMWs in our family. It's disappointing from that perspective. Like we should have more technical detail, but it goes back to this conversation. It's a German company and in They don't America, prioritize asking, answering questions. Exactly. It's, it's fucking annoying. Bob Van Dull, the second, $20. Please compare the new M2 to my F87 M2C or M2 competition. Also, how can I, how, how can a M5 and M8 still look damn good, but the M3 and M4 are ugly? It's a generation of the product for that. The M3 and the M4 were designed later. It's the new design language. Guaranteed, the M5 and the M8, when the next ones come out, they're just as ugly. M5 is M5 and M8, I think, aren't they killing off the 8 Series? I thought they were killing it off. I don't off. remember. Uh, anyway, even if they didn't, let's say the M5 and the M8 come out, they're going to look like the 7 Series. The, like, stodgy, yeah, weird-looking... What did you say that it looked like? It looked like a... I don't know, some really weird comparison. Looks horrible. Is what okay. It, All right, well, um, the new, we're going to do a new M2 video whenever we get one. That's the one big project I pitched BMW on. They said maybe. Um, I'm hoping it's good, but honestly, everything I've read and everything I've talked to people about, it's going to drive like the M3 or the M4 but a little bit smaller and a little bit less powerful. That M2 is ugly as shit, dude. Yeah, it's ugly. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, I, I, whatever. Yeah, it's an ugly car, man. I would keep your M2. Is there a date on the GT3 RS vi uh, video? I can't tell you when the press drive is for the America, but it's coming. Yeah, coming in the next couple months. Yep. Our video should be out in the next couple months. months. Yeah. Uh, eight, uh, Ragnar Khan, thank you for the $10. HDR content looks great. Didn't expect it. The Type R headlights to blast my retinas to the back of my brain during my morning trip to the porcelain throne. Any production difficulties with HDR? I, I mean, like I told Jack, and he's probably already like cringing because this is like a three-hour discussion, but I can't believe the amount of work that it was to find out information about HDR uh, and how to do it for YouTube. And it it's, it's not that it's... There's a lot, like Linus Tech Tips talks about this, a lot of HDR channels, and I talked to somebody that works in Hollywood, essentially, as a cinematographer and, and more. Um, it's because people don't understand the technical part of doing it and how to do it, and the fact that it's very expensive to produce an HDR video. So in the real world, for delivery of HDR, you're working for a major studio, Disney, Amazon, Netflix, right? Like, those are the places that are going to have HDR delivery. For social media, you can forget it, because you need... A $5,000 plus display that's calibrated, calibrated correctly, and then you need all the software to be synced up, like Windows or Mac. Uh, you need your editing program to be synced up with color profile and connected to the, the display properly to edit in that workspace, and then you need to export it properly. Um, and, and all those moving pieces plus the cost is why people don't do it, period. And to upload it and make sure the HDR version and the SDR, which is like 4K. There's 4K SDR, there's 4K HDR. And to make sure that both those look the same because they're handled differently, that's the problem. And that's the problem I'm having. It takes work to get there. And most people don't want to spend the time to do that for like less than 2% of the audience that has HDR content outside of their phone. Most of our phones can do HDR on our screens because that's how they are. But most people on TVs and most people on computers don't have HDR displays. 
So a lot of people don't do it because of that. And I'm gonna do it because I wanna future-proof the content and I will figure out how to way to make SDR and HDR work properly. Um, and once you do it, once you figure it out, it's like everything else. And then it becomes a part of the, the workflow. Um, again, that's why I have a Dell partnership. That's why I have the help on the technical and the hardware side, because now I have the equipment. I have the help on the technical side to work through this shit. I have contacts with Nvidia if I need it. I will have contacts with Intel. So, you know, like, it sounds like bullshit, but really, as on your own, if you're having people work in these major industries like Hollywood, yep. not knowing how to do it, or they're having problems doing it, and you're talking about somebody who's making content on YouTube, like, I need help, period. I mean, I've figured it out on my own without a lot of help, but it's it's still, again, one more thing to do. Anyway, that's the, sh the short and long answer. Next question. James, would you recommend Olin's dampers as an upgrade to a, uh, a Miata RF for non-track use? Seeing as you guys have experience with them, thanks. Yes, do it 100%. Like if you I can said afford before. it and it, you know, you're okay doing the work, it'll really they're not that something game. that's going to fuck up the car and it's not something that's going to screw it up long term. And anybody that buys it will think the thing's jewelry as long as you don't drive it in the salt and you set it up right and you get the, the suspension assembled right, your alignment right, and you make sure you use the Olin's top hats that, that you can get. You're all good. Uh, next one is Kia K5 GT thoughts. My focus got T-boned. I'm glad you're all right. Thank yes. you for the $10. I like the car. I think it's great. It's just know what you're getting into it. The, the, the dynamic problems of that car are not tremendous with the high output engine. Yeah. It has the same problem as like the Sonata. Yeah. And the gearboxes aren't great. It's a lot of car for the money though. It the, is, yeah. To me, if you can get a Civic though, honestly, like a Civic hatch, I think it's a better car. Do, you, yeah. How much did they pay you for that ad? A lot. Okay. A so lot. buy a Civic, don't buy a Kia product. Oh, that 100,000 mile warranty is nothing. <laughs> I, I, I think it's great. I think it's one of the best mid-sized cars. I just, you know, now with all the bullshit with the reliability. It's, That's my big problem. Yeah, yeah and they're not, they're not the most transparent brand either. Um, $19.99, $19.99 from Fodios. Thank you very much. Would you would love to know what you guys think about the ML or the GLE 350 prior to the 2020 redesign? They have naturally aspirated V6s, and I heard they are reliable. Uh, that's my understanding. I don't know the repair part of that car. I'll be honest. And personally, like it, Jack and I are the same, and we've gotten more aligned. If I'm going that direction, I'm always buying BMW or Audi every single time. Or you know, if I had more money, I would get a Porsche. Um, if you're a Mercedes person you're much safer with a naturally aspirated V6 if that's what you're worried about. And if that's the car you want, I don't think that you're going to go wrong. Just make sure you have a warranty at least to like 75,000 miles to mitigate any potential problems that you do have. Buying an old luxury product that's a commodity product yeah. used and is going to be a painful process when it comes to repairs. And if you're trying to do it on a budget, just be prepared. I'm not saying it's going to happen to you, but be prepared. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Chris, hello again. Nine ninety nine. Do you think YouTube limits certain content creators' growth? Typically, those that are conservative through their phones listening, like they do for ad search history, video preference. Um, I think in certain areas, yes. I think they're looking more for what's going to make them money, right? I mean, if you fall in, if you look at their guidelines for monetizing a video, every time I monetize a video here, which I don't want to bring up because it's just too much work it'll have this list of things of what you have in your video and then it's okay to monetize. As long as you're within that scope and you're advertiser friendly, they make all their money through, ad through advertisers. So if you check all those boxes, they're gonna promote the shit out of they your video. They don't care what your content is, honestly, right. as long as it can make the money. If they cared about what the content was, they'd be more hands-on with individual creators curating more and more of it. But it's an, you're on an island on your own and as long as you're reaching out to an audience and you meet their, their criteria, you should be able to, you should be fine. Um, there's a lot more tricks to this and we talked about it earlier like if you calling out likes and subscribes and every video has like a ton of likes a ton of subscribes a lot of engagement and a lot of like reshareable content where when they share it it keeps accelerating they don't care what that content is as long as it meets all that stuff and if you can play within those confines yes you're going to be successful do they limit people artificially through all that I don't think that they do I just think there's certain things that will grow faster than others it's just the nature of the beast. Um, when do you think a Chinese brand will finally crack the U.S. market? Hyundai Kia was 20 years ago. Will Vietnam beat China? This is Matt for $4.99. Uh, 
Do we have any mainstream Chinese vehicles besides Volvo? V well, well, <laughs> Geely. But I mean, that that that's not fair because Volvo's not Chinese. I know, I know. You know what I mean? Like, not they're not out of China coming into the Chinese market. I think uh, I never talk about political stuff on this channel, but I think the political animosity that the U.S. and China have with one another, and I think that's only going to get worse, is going to stop a Chinese brand with a Chinese name making it in the U.S. long term. The Vietnamese have a much higher likelihood of that happening. Just to be honest, you know, in, in, in Russia, Chinese cars do really, really well. Yeah. They're not going to do well here in this country, not for a long time, because of the political stuff. Yeah. And I, I, to be honest, I don't know anything about the Chinese car market other than I lived in China for a long time as an expat, but you know back then it was primarily uh, American and German and Japanese cars. Like the Chinese vehicles were viewed as cheap shit boxes. Yeah, I don't know anything about their higher end or commodity cars, the kind of cars that would be brought here and sold. So I can't. Answer I don't that think question. it's happening here. I, I I agree with you. I think the the consensus is people would be opposed to it unless you had some amazing like. Even then, they would have to do what Geely did and buy out brands to make it work. That's it. Yeah. Uh, it's going to take a long time. If it did, it would be twenty plus years. Also, please stop asking more paid questions or questions in general. Uh, we're going to try to get through all the the last paid questions and, and, and yeah, kill I can't us. yeah because we can't keep up with anything more. Um, how about some old car reviews like the Citroen SM? Thank you for the ten dollars. Uh, thank you, Stefan, as well. Um, we're trying. We like to do some more old cars, and the problem is what we can get. We're doing some K car videos here shortly, and it comes down to viewers and or businesses that see value in what we do and are willing to work around the long shoot times. Like we know Scott at King Motorsports really, really well in the CRX, and like the Mark IV Supra. He left. Uh, Albon just left us the car for for months. Right, but that's Albon. That's not a normal person. Yeah. you know what I mean. Normally, it's like a week or at least yeah. half a week. Like to shoot you can't one of these you videos. can't take a private owner's car for like two or three weeks. I mean, like we'd have to bang it out, and our schedule would have to be open. And you know, like I was joking around with somebody. They're like, "Oh, you 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 said, oh yeah, you'll be slower in the winter, and then you're even busier because." The, the money is lower after, like, the money is the worst in January, February, March, and April. So you have to actually do more work to make up for the fact that there's less money available. So the, there's no way to ever take a break doing this. That's what sucks. Um, but the, the viewer stuff is, like, we want to do it in good weather where the risks are low to a private owner's car. We don't want to be getting it dirty and all that crap. So uh, there's a lot more liability with doing older cars that are private owners, too. We have, like, contracts that people have to sign. You have the liability waivers, but there's still a risk there, and, like, we try to stay away from that as much as possible. Morgan S., thank you very much for the $50. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, after my order last January, it took seven months to take delivery of my Chevy Spark. Wow. Um, seven months. <laughs> it was all worth it, though, to own an American icon. <laughs> You guys are free to borrow it for a documentary. Do you see any future cars <laughs> in the U.S. for an expensive? You got, you got me, dude. Well done, sir. Or unless it's Morgan could be a female because our audience is ninety nine point one percent female. Right. Well, Morgan, um, I, I I will tell you as a joke uh, so, uh, when we pitched GM on the Z06 project, the same gentleman who's in charge of the Chevy Trax. Just to be an asshole, I'm like, look, we'll do a documentary on the Chevy Trax for you as well. But sadly, the car was announced too early for us to be oh, taken up on that offer. Yeah, we, we missed out. So we'll, we'll have to meet up with you. Um, I'm looking at trying to make this a six-month project. So if it takes me like a month to shoot all the wheels for the Chevy back, Spark? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the wor world's first thermal electric camera where I excite the wheels with electricity to see the, the atom space of how they design these things. Uh, all right, next one. Whatever I just said didn't make any sense. Hello, guys. I have the opportunity to buy an LC500. Would my seven-mile commute be bad for the car, including Autobahn? Uh, just, it has to get up to temperature. Really, it's about the thermal cycle. So just because your engine's up to temperature and the coolant and the oil may be up to temperature, that doesn't mean the gearbox is up to temperature. It doesn't mean suspension, bushings, electronics, and all that. So that's what really hurts a car when you get to this uneven, uneven thermal cycling of a product. So you want to make sure that you drive it long enough to get these systems worked up. And then you don't want to be shocking the car. Like You don't want to get it to like maximum heat and then maximum cooling off. You always want to keep it somewhere in the middle. So the, the long story short is short commutes are really bad. And then like abusive commutes where you just like 
beat the fuck out of it and then just, hey, park it in a refrigerator and like let it shock. Yep. So try to drive it a little bit more um, if you can. Uh, or Before least, you hop in the Autobahn and do 900 yeah, miles an right, hour. Right. I think seven miles, honestly, as long as you're not, like, tr try to drive it moderately. Don't just, like, leave it at 1,500 RPM. Try to get it, like, 3,500 or below to get some of these systems going. Not kind of an odd explanation. What happened to Turbowski? I invited him back to do a cameo. Uh, that's where I'm going to leave it. It hasn't happened. Uh, will Savage Geese ever be in 10-bit 8K so I can enjoy this on my 16K Android phone? <laughs> uh, Thank you, Joseph, uh, for the uh, canter for the $10. Yeah, I don't know, man. That's going to be a while. Uh, probably another... Uh, you know, with all this, the commercials I'm shooting for Honda dealerships now, I could I could be making 8K money here to, to buy, what, an $80,000 camera body? And what, a $60,000 lens to start? Well, a lens kit would be like 300000 that's a deal. With those prices, you can't afford not to do it. If anybody wants to buy the K-Series lenses from Canon that have been rebodied um, from the film days for me, I will shoot everything in that, but I think it's like 300000 <laughs> I mean, but you're getting five lenses. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> think, of, think of what we can shoot. Joe, Joe. Thank, you, thank you for the $10. Joe, Joe. you look that per picture. I'm sorry, but you look so professional. It makes me feel bad about myself. Need more Type R videos. You can count on it. I'm going to the dealership tomorrow to shoot more. Super John, sticker. thank you for the super sticker. Thank you. James, John, thank you for, James, the ten, thank for the $10, you. sir. Thank you very much. As much as I hate to say this, why isn't there lobbying against the EPA to set realistic emissions goals for cars to make them more affordable? Trump was the only person who seemed to do this. And I don't think Trump really did it because he knew what he was doing. I think it was just because he was like being asked to do it by a lot of the people that had and the I money. I don't even think the, the EPA regulations are the pure thing that's set prices for cars, I think a lot of the reasons why you've seen cars get more expensive, other than obviously inflation, is all the shit people expect in cars now. Right. Like you got Mazda is a primary example or great example of traditional four cylinder cars outside of their turbo variants. Mm -hmm. yeah. They get amazing fuel economy of no bullshit associated with them. Right. That that's true. I, I mean I, I think the EPA stuff is much different than the features people expect. Um I, I don't know enough of the inside baseball, the regulation part of it, and the government part, that who really sets the criteria, because the manufacturer is a huge lobby, mm -hmm. right? Like, there's a lot of money that backs them, and they're still not able to dictate regulation enough. I don't know if it's come back to bite them over the years of, like, okay, they got away with murder, now the regulatory process is becoming oppressive to them, and it's, like, not working no in their favor. But clearly, I think a lot of the regulations are not set by people that know the long term and the big picture part of how things actually work. If they had a body of like engineers, economists, people that work in saying the industry. politicians don't actually know anything? Well, <laughs> I, I mean, there, there's some smart people, but clearly in this space, there's not a really good like understanding of what the long term yeah, effect of this is. They're not particularly technically minded. Next yeah. question. Raphael, $10. I don't get it. Everyone moving to SUVs, but I never see more than two people in them. And they're carrying, they're never carrying anything. This has been going on since the 2000s. When the SUV boom came, uh, there was a huge push against it. You even had political pressure or social pressure against Ford to kill the, uh, uh, what was the pile? The Canyon Arrow from the Yeah, the, not the Expedition, the bigger one. Oh, the Excursion? Yeah, th there was political pressure for them to kill the, the Excursion because it was excess. And now we're there back again and but worse. BBs. And EVs and everything, right? And the reality is this is what people want. This is what people want, and it's okay, and that's what people have the money to buy, and that's what manufacturers are going to make, and that's it. You, you, like, if you told somebody that, why are you driving this big car and it's only you in it, they will make 100 excuses, and the first reaction will be anger. Go fuck yourself. You can't tell people to change. You can't people to tell them what's right or wrong. Like, they have to learn on their own, and that's why we're, like always so behind the eight ball with everything like practicality practical sense like this doesn't make sense more so in this country we want everything big um we want everything massive we want like the screen thing is hilarious like manufacturers tell us like everybody wants big screens like why well they want big screens because it looks cool it like, doesn't mean it's better yes right now and the screen is enormous for no reason. For no reason. Yeah, it doesn't make it any better. But again, you can translate that mentality of the screen into cars and all that. And I'm not saying that big cars don't have a functional purpose. Like, 
I have an X7, but I'm using it to haul shit. Yeah, I'm from, using it for, for camera cars. Out of the back to shoot other cars. Do yeah. I need an X7 to do that? No, no it's a luxury a, product. You need an Urus. I need an SUV, or I need a minivan. Really, is more than anything. But you know, again, it doesn't make logical sense. I don't really need it, but I want it because I put a lot of miles I can, on. I can haul all my gold bars. And back this there. guy can hold his gold bars. And if I put him in a minivan, he would think we're in a we're in a bad business. <laughs> So anyway, you know, it, there's contradictory points to all this. Next I, question. I agree with you, man. There, there needs to be some change, but it's not happening. Uh, j please just watch and review Sam Hyde Lamborghini Huracan review on stream. Uh, I will watch that maybe one day. But thank you so much for the $10. I don't even know who Sam Hyde is. I think I've seen some of his stuff. I, I don't want to flip over to... Um... Is it like insufferable, I would assume, or? I assume it's pretty horrible. Was it, which car was I, it? Dude, I don't watch it, I have no idea. Yeah, that's the Huracan. All right, move on to the next question. We'll, we'll visit that later. Man, it's your, it's your boy. Uh, <laughs> this, car, this car makes me so mad that I don't even want to go have my chocolate chip pancake breakfast. <laughs> Okay. All right. You can count me in. I will watch it. <laughs> I'm sure you could hear that in the background. And uh, no, that was that's pretty amazing. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I will watch that. I just put it put it in my watch later. All right. Uh, next. Then we oh type S to G70. Uh, hard, 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 hard question. Uh, depends on what you're doing with it. I like the Type S better as like a daily commuter, but the G70 is a lot more better, a lot more engaging to drive because of the rear-wheel drive aspect of it. Yeah, you know, Chin Face is back. Oh, he is. He's in our comments. Oh, good. Is he moderating? Yeah, uh, no. moderating. Uh, he's like, oh man, I, now we can do this for another four hours. Mr. Goose, did Marisol Patel ever learn how to successfully drive stick? Yes, and then uh, after she no longer needed that vehicle because she got her own car back, she never drove it again, and that's a true story. <laughs> Thanks for the advice. Here's a bottle of Goose Island for you. Joe718GT4, $10. Are you going to make out with this guy? Because Is that a Miami Blue or is that... Yeah, it's uh, Miami, Miami Blue. Blue GT4. And we're both Asian. Oh, really? Yeah. That's what I hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys stick together. <laughs> Uh, Hafid, Hafid Rodart. Thank you very much for the $20. Uh, thank you for the great content. Your hard work is definitely appreciated. I have a tuned B9 RS5. Thinking of getting a 20 plus 911S or a 19 Vantage. Uh, do the 911S. The RS5, surprisingly, was really solid. Uh, the B9 platform was really good, but I would... The 911 is way better than yeah, the Vantage. Yeah, don't touch the Vantage, dude. Thoughts, speed, luxury, and comfort are my main points. The, the 911 is just comfortable enough... It's super usable, and it's fast as hell for what it is. And you can and, actually get it worked on. Yeah, and you can have a lot of fun with it. It's a, it's the best of all worlds. Even though it may seem a little bit more boring than the Vantage, it does what it's set out to do. The Dude 365. Have you guys looked into Utreon donating for more premium Kirkland's uh, signature, signature content? content. Uh, Utreon? No, I have not. Uh, I will put that in another tab here, To uh, assuming you're being serious because my sarcasm is broken. And I spell there. No, you didn't spell it right. Oh, know. I didn't. What is it? Oh. Oops. Here. I still didn't spell it right. There we go. The world of tomorrow. It's already here. So we may as well laugh. Okay. Anyway, move, move I'll look on. it up. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate the donation, as always. Peter Gonzalez, as a new father, I'm looking at selling my ND2 Miata. Is there a car you can recommend that can give me a similar emotional, res res emotional response. response? Manual preferred. The really the only thing is the 86, and it has. You a can't price. really. Yeah, you could. You put, could. You could. You're. You could put a car seat in the back of the 86, but you never want to take it out, and you're going to have to be prepared to f be frustrated getting in and out of that back seat. If you're okay and you're limber and you can make the excuse for having a fun car, the 86 ride's just good enough where it's not going to be an issue. It's a pretty safe car. It's a fun car and you're not going to have your soul sucked out. So I'm going to leave it at that. Next question. Savage Geese, Mark, are you going to do an update video on your XC90? Do you still have it or is it in the trash heap? 
I traded in for an X7 and I will have an X7 video of why I sold the XC90 and the X7 with the refreshed X7 together and including an MDX Type S like series. So it's gonna be like three videos. Uh, and, and that's whenever I get around to it. And it will be in the next two months because we have the press car coming next mm -hmm. month, correct? Joe M, the corrupt FBI and CIA are watching everything. They're watching you. AJ, thank you for your... Oh, Dizzle, my man. <laughs> thank you for your $5 you. super sticker. <laughs> Gabriel Smiley, look, he's smiling in his picture. $9.99. Thank you for your honesty and outstanding quality. Thank you. And this one is... Two dollars and ninety nine cents. What do you think about the new Mustang GT? Well, that is a, another one of those pay. projects that uh, we're probably, hopefully, going to do. We're pitched forward on a big, big Mustang project for the new car. Um, I think it's basically an evolution of a current product, which isn't the end of the world. But I think the last one looked better. But I think if it, you bring a lot of the suspension improvements from GT three hundred and fifty and trickle them down into regular Mustang and you improve the interior space, it, it's fine. Uh, the, the, the sad part is Camaro's dying and Challenger's 10 million years old. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, 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 there's not... I mean, it's going to be a sad future when these cars go away. You know what I mean? Like, the, as much as the Challenger and the Charger have gotten, like, a horribly bad rap now, they've turned into, like, this... Meme cars? Yeah, meme cars with all the... Uh, street stuff and all that crap. I mean, they are special. I think I'm gonna miss the Mustang when it's gone. I mean, I, the Camaro. We have we're another gonna generation miss. Yeah, of that's Mustang, true. but I think the generation after this next one apparently is gonna go EV, which is not ideal. Um, not that there's anything inherently wrong with that. I just, if EVs are the way they are today, I don't. I'm not super looking forward to it. How many more questions do you want to answer, Mark? Because we've um, been doing this for three and a half hours. I'm gonna cut this off and. Uh, I'm going to try to get through these three or four, or I'm sorry. There's, there's quite a, a few more. There's, there's quite a few more. I'm just scrolling up now to look and see to a certain point. Um, we'll try to bang these out really quick. I'm going up to 8.23, back up to 8, 8, 8 p.m., 8.23 p.m., uh, and I think that's where we're going to leave it. Uh, so for RJ... For $49, I'm sorry, I can show your question. You guys are the best reviewers and keep me company every morning after morning coffee. RJ, thank you very much. Bro. Yeah, thank That's you. Very good. Hopefully it doesn't ruin your coffee. Uh, $5 of the CT4 and CT5's not like wing any good for the money. The BWs get all the attention. That's true. Man, I, I've never driven them, so I don't know. I, I, I couldn't tell you. But the black wings are really special for VA. a reason. V8 or... Great manual six. V8. <laughs> yeah, V8. The V8's good, man. The CT5, the CT5 is where I, would, I wouldn't I would even bother with the CT4. The CT5 is like old American, like V8, V8 luxury. You, I don't see you needing all the power of a V. V8. But V8. $20. How do you think the history will view the VBWRX? Will it get forgotten or will there be dying will, or will the dying of standard standalone ice make people look at it more I favorable? Need to look up what the VBWRX is. Oh, it's the current generation WRX. Paint. I think it'll just be another WRX. I think, I think they're going to fix it mid mid cycle. I think they're going to mind a painting at mid cycle. Or you know, people were talking about the cross truck. Why not just make that like a WRX going forward? Because people love these crossover things. People love the cross truck. Why not just make that the performance moniker going forward instead of like the traditional WRX that they're nerfing? I mean, they've nerfed the hell out of it at this point. So, like, I, I don't know. I, I think it's good. It just needs work. They need to fix some of the problems that it has. And I think they will do it before it gets killed. I agree. All right. Uh, we got $5 from Christian. If you were an OEM, how would you make your vehicles less? not disposable being able to fix them more simplicity when it comes to like the RAV4 is the primary example if I if I was making commodity cars and I was gonna try to sell a lot of them and try to tell people that they could keep them five to seven years I'd make everything now as a standout to be just modern enough like the RAV4 is just reliable enough that you can keep it for a long long time that would be my template. Like I think throwing every feature at a vehicle and ignoring mechanical 
bits of the vehicle and mechanical maintenance components is not the right move. It has to be a ground up rethink. So if you were gonna give a manufacturer advice, that means you have to take into account that a lot of the things that we want them to do will not sell cars. Mm -hmm. The other things we want them to do will not meet regulatory emissions without a massive amount of R&D. So for me, I'd be like, naturally aspirated engines across the board that were built from the ground up, one for efficiency, one for power, and then build it out where it's easy to work on, parts are available, not overcomplicated, um, then have a powerful version of it, but they're never gonna do that because it's easier to downsize them. And then the same thing with electronics on the inside. You know, make it modular, but don't have all the tech that, that kills these cars and makes them more expensive, like having 20 sensors and bumpers that yeah. if you get into a 10 mile impact, the, the repair bill is like $6,000. This is becoming a requirement. It's becoming an expectation. So there's no way to go back at this point. There's just no way to fix it. I'm, I'm sorry, I, there's ways to make it more easy to fix and less disposable, but it's contradictory to what the buying public wants. So it's just not gonna happen. Um, $10, how difficult are making comparison videos? Chances on getting a comparison video of 50 to 60 sports. Thank 60 you, Kyle. Sport, you know? We tried doing one with RS3 and Blackwing. Audi backed out. Yeah, if it's press cars, it's really hard because if you're gonna take it from a performance perspective, they don't want a loser, of course. And if it's timed, they don't want a loser, a timed lap. Uh, there's liability there with putting it on a track. So we're gonna, we have a comparison coming up in a couple weeks that will be a good test of that. Just let us know when you see the comparison what you think of it for like regular street cars. Okay. Uh, Planetary 13, $5. Please review an SVT Focus or an old manual Audi S-Car. S-car. Yeah. We have an Audi RS4, the one with the V8 that rubbed out, that has been offered to us. It's just about time getting out to do it. Okay. Yeah, the SVT Focus, and I think somebody said SVT Contour, which I drove both those, and I mean, it'd be an interesting video. I think it'd just be hard to find one that wasn't totally you know, fucked up. Yeah, trashed. Thanks, Big Big D, <laughs> for the for 20. super sticker. We got 20 bucks from Big D. Thank you, sir. Uh, $2 CA, TLX Type S or G70. Didn't we do that? I think we did, but we're going to answer it again. I'll change my answer this time just to make everybody happy. B58. The, the B58, B58 TLX Type yeah. S. Yeah, that Type S is a great car if you're not really driving crazy and you don't want like rear-wheel drive dynamics. G70 yeah. has rear-wheel drive dynamics. Yeah, and I think the engine is better. better. But you have to deal with the Hyundai Kia dealer. Yeah, sure. Uh, did you pay over MSRP on the Z06? If you did, I'm sorry. If you didn't, congratulations. Brent Owen for $499. I did not. Next question. Keep up the uh, Black Conservative Patriot for $20. Keep up the great work. I really enjoy your reviews, and I really like your breakdown for 2022. Very informative and entertaining. Thanks, man. I appreciate it, and thank you for the $20. Thank you. Thoughts on the CT5 V-Series non-Blackwing? I haven't driven it, and thank you for the $5. I'll ask for it. I just don't think they particularly care about the car, so they're not in the fleet. I think it. I, I think I, people would watch it because nobody talks about it. Oh, well, well, yeah, let's see if we can get it. Why not? How? I mean, it's not going to be a horrible experience. A TL pay for $2.99. Thanks again, man. Uh, certain perf... I can't even say it. Perfect ratio. Certain perfect ratio, ratio, ratio okay. Mark. It's all one word. You know, I can't read. A dollar for every time I've watched the Pacifica review. Now, if I could only convince my wife's boyfriend to buy one for our family, that's going to be a tough sell, but I think you can do some arm twisting. Do you have any leverage? <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Do you have leverage... Over uh, your wife's boyfriend. Yes, and do you have kids? Because if you have kids, you can really, really... You could really leverage yeah, that. Yeah, so th things might be looking up for you. Uh, DSC. Thank uh, you for the $5, thank sir. Thank you for the $5. We have uh, DSC no, for, again. <laughs> for two, two, well, it's $10 here. I have a first-gen 2015 X135i, and nobody gives a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Could I get some validation? Yeah, X1. Hey, we're doing an X1 soon. You'll yeah. get all the validation. I will I will mention DSC by name. When we Where is it. X1? It's a BMW. We get, no, I mean, when are we getting it? Uh, a couple weeks. Oh, I didn't know that. You're going to get some validation on that video. I'll be like, DSC... Uh, that's like, you know what? I will start the video mentioning you. DSC is finally getting the validation. Oh, but it's 2015. We don't care about that. No. But we only care about new product, man. Sorry. Sorry, DSC. Uh, it's a BMW. It's got the badge. Do the, the do the anniversary badges with the blue in it. Change that out. Then you'll get validation. Uh, J999. Why isn't Mark wiping his head oil and looking at it on his fingers? Who are you? I, I think it's because I'm in a different mindset today. I reduce my oil 
intake and my mo minoxidil uh <laughs> so i'm not as oily jay thanks for the ten dollars thank you thanks for making fun of me that really hurts and we've had, i will answer a couple more questions because we're back to the beginning okay oh man we got a lot of questions oh shit i did all let me go to the bottom because i think there might be a couple more uh paid ones that i that we missed. Don't, Size this don't pay anymore because you're going to lose your money and you're gonna, not going to get your question answered. Uh, thanks guy. for the great content. What would you guys like to see in a potentially revamped 2023 Forerunner? Uh, we just did a Tacoma TRD Pro video. I revisited the first car I ever did a video on and that was a disaster. If you want a good laugh, go watch that video. But what I want out of the Forerunner is I want it to be more of the same but with a... I mean, I don't know. Toyota's in that rough spot where... I'll say what I said in the video. They want to bring along old customers who bought their cars that were reliable and simple, but they need them to compete against vehicles that are now objectively better. And I don't know how they do that for the 4Runner because they're going to either, when they redo it, it'll either be a turbocharged four-cylinder, which is probably what it's going to be, or it'll be basically the Sequoia, but smaller. And I'm, the Sequoia wasn't very good, and that's my fear. Uh... KG for $5 from one soy chai latte connoisseur to another. Thanks for the content, fella, uh, fellas. Don't spill any on my $10.99 a month seat heaters. Yeah, that would be... I wonder what would happen if you broke the seat heaters with like a soy latte. And, hey, could you argue that your subscription isn't worthwhile anymore <laughs> and get your money back? Oh, man. It's uh, the tiny pyramid for $2. It's too bad about the Chevy Ligma. I don't know anything about the Chevy Ligma. Loot. <laughs> for ten dollars, any chance of a retrospective series for a German brand? I love to see one on golfs. I know Mark is a Honda fanboy. If any brand is going to let us do a retrospective series, it's going to be Porsche. Mm -hmm. I would love to do one on the nine eleven, but they don't actually have a museum fleet here in the U.S. I can ask. I'd love to do one on a nine eleven or or. A I, yeah, I think that's the, and I even mentioned it in the CRX video is like taking an account, like you can't talk about the CRX without talking about the old Golfs in yeah. some cases, even though we're very focused on the CRX. The Golf is also a special car of that era because it's like, like the car just spins itself. Yeah. You know, it's hilarious. And I think it's worth trying to get one, but I just don't want to get a ch like a horribly shitty one. You know, it's got to be almost original, yeah. like Scott's car with very minimal and work done. possible to find right. for someone who lets you drive it. Well, especially out here. Uh, we Gene, don't live in California. Thank you for the $10. Uh, I have a Dodge Durango with 100,000 miles on it. Keep it going. Keep going with it and wait for EVs in five years or buy another gas car. Uh, Personally, I would just buy another gas car. And yes, I have kids and grabbed all my suburban nightmare. Another gas car. The, a lot of people that I, I I know that had the Durango, I don't know what mile, what year the Durango is, but a lot of the older ones, honestly, were really, really reliable, despite them rotting out looking like... Shit. Yeah, people are like, oh, God, that thing's going to hit me. But they were pretty easy to work on and modular, and they were fairly <laughs> reliable. I mean, they're not my favorite thing on the planet. I'm sure it's not yours. It just depends on how much you want to blow to replace it. You know, if you're spending $40,000 to get another hauler, you know, honestly, in the modern car thing, like... I, I if would, you need to get another car... Yeah, if, if that 100,000-mile Durango is messed up and you're going to put, like, $10,000 to get it fixed, to put it into a new car. If, if, it, if it's going to cost you a couple grand a year to keep it going, I think until things evolve out a little bit more... Just I'd buy just, another gasser. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think that's about everything, right? I think we covered everything. What's this last one? Yeah, that's him. So, unbelievably, I think we got through a majority of everything. And if we, like we always say in all of our live streams, if there's a burning question you have for Mark or I, and Patreons, I will go back and make sure all of the Patreon questions are answered. Um, DM us on Instagram. Um, you can find me on Instagram or Mark, and we will do our best to answer those questions. Purely because Mark it just hates you guys. He's less likely to respond on Instagram than I am. I, I honestly, I, I'm on Instagram and it's purely like nonsense. I, I, I mean, I really I'll don't do my like best that. to get back to you guys if you uh, DM me on Instagram. Jack is definitely more uh, connected on there because he likes to show up all his Corvette pictures. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, man. He's like, oh, man, look at this girl who likes me. I'm like 10 to 1. That's not a girl. Don't worry. No, no girl likes Corvettes. They like type R's. Um, and John Z and everyone else that are our personal friends that are in the chat right now. Thank you again for spending time with us. We finally met Sean Keeley in person. That guy, 
He's got quite the jawline. Yeah, there's a lot of people that we meet traveling. Like, Jack, um, we had these three trips that are coming up, and I'm like, I can't. Like, I can't physically go on three weeks worth of travel and then come back and have to try to shit out videos, you know, and edit this stuff and do a good job. So... I can only travel once in a while, and a lot of times it's it sucks because we travel on these trips and they have to like be social and meet all these people that we really like, and then you have to do all this work. And it's like I would rather just travel just to talk to people, people and not actually drive the cars sometimes. Um, um, so, guys, thank you for those who actually sat through this horribly long live stream. Yeah, and Jack has like an hour and a half commute back, or not an hour and a half, no. but like an hour commute back home, and he's up late, and he's really this guy's I'm heart. Weak. This guy's heart is in it. Wait, oh, we gotta watch that dude's uh, <laughs> Sam Hyde video. All right, thank you all for uh, for doing this. Yeah, I really appreciate your time, and we're gonna try to do one of these once a month now that I'm all set up. Uh, also, last thing before we go, um, just out of curiosity, what was the live stream like this time uh, in terms of quality, uh, quality interface, like sound? All of that, I'm hoping this was probably the best one yet, or am I just selling it to you to tell me that? What was your real experience? The same good night, because they hate you. No, they don't leave yet. Look, there's more to cover here. You got work to do for me. These people just don't think their job's done with because we're done. <laughs> I'm not done. Like, did I tell you about my Corvette enough? I need to talk to you more about my Corvette. Okay, good. It's like it's like everything's positive about it. So now I got to spend thirty dollars a month for another subscription, Jack, to pay for a live streaming service. So I, there's no way I'm gonna make my money back with all these super stickers. I should give myself a super sticker so I feel like I'm a special man. Uh, is there anything else you want to say? Because no, you mic off. I turned off my mic. Okay, okay Jack. Leaving. Jack's leaving. Uh, thank you, Jack. Here, let's pan the camera over. We'll give him behind the scenes of my, sh my horrible space that I have in here now. Oh, let me put my autofocus on. Okay, so this is, I don't wanna pull this out of here. Goodbye, Bye. everybody. Bye, Jack. See ya, good luck to you and your family. All right, so this is it. This is my office. This is the desk I'm gonna do for color correction, which the monitor won't be there. Uh, I have speakers to mount, and then we flip over here. There's my trophy case. Okay, that's really important to me. Okay, so what we have here, these sunglasses were gifted to me uh, from the Honda Civic dealership. They only sell Honda Civics and they, they told me I'm a VIP and I'm gonna get these for free. And I autographed my own sunglasses and I'm gonna wear them every time I drive my Civic. Okay, the next one is all my trophies. Uh, I'm a winner and oh, there's an old Civic Type R we never got in the U.S. and I never drove this, so I put it in my case. And then this is an F1 car. This is Lewis Hamilton. He's won a couple F1 championships. Uh, this is when the car had a V8 in it, by the way, not some uh, horrible sounding six cylinder. So I, I put that in there and remember the golden era of when things were great. So that's the tour of my trophy case. Uh, and then we have more stuff over here, which I can't pan all the way. This is my other desk. This is where I do regular editing because I have a, an ultra wide uh, and look at the focus. It's hunting. Anyway, that's everything in my office. Thanks for the tour, guys. Um, if you guys like this, I suggest you, you hit that thumb. There's a thumb on there that you can hit. I just hit the zebra button. Um, there's a thumb that's thumbs up and then people will like me and uh, I'll have a lot of friends on the internet. So I wish everybody the best day possible and thanks for staying up so late with us and bless you and goodbye and uh, I don't have anything else funny to say or not actually that none of that was funny. Thank you again. Man, I really needed to put an outro thing here. How the hell do you disconnect this thing now? Goodbye forever.